Welcome to Modern Day Debate. We are a neutral platform welcoming all walks of life. If you're looking for more fantastic debates, don't forget to like or subscribe, including tonight's debate on Is Gravity Fake? With both of our interlocutors, Iron Horse and Jago, here to help us find some answers. And if you enjoy what either of them have to say tonight, both of our guest links are in the description below. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Jago for their up to 12 minute opening statement. All right, Amy, you're going to have to cut me off because once I get started, I'm not going to be able to stop. There's basically three big areas we could go into this. And I think the first one is probably what the people want. You know, it's like, ah, oh, let's talk about the science. Let's talk about the Cavendish experiment. Let's talk about special relativity, density, buoyancy, uh, get into all those details. And I'm happy to do that. But what I think might be more interesting, deeper and more important uh, is to talk about epistemology. That is, where do we get our truth? Where do we get our sense of knowledge and ultimately authority? I want to get into theology as part of that. And I also want to talk about psychology. I want to talk about what makes a person a globalist, I'm a globalist, you know, physically, politically, but also what makes a person a flat earther or more generally, what makes a person conservative, traditionalist, a dissident, someone who is not, you know, riding the, the wave of loving science and whatnot. What psychologically makes a person like that? Because I think at the end of the day, uh, the beliefs that we hold are often rooted in deep psychological needs we have that in some senses, we all share these things in common, but uh, they express themselves to different degrees and in different ways in each individual. So I guess just to split those three sections up here into a 12 minute intro, um, we've got the Cavendish experiment. The Cavendish experiment is essentially you've got a room, you've got uh, a hanging twine or wire rope, and you've got something like a ruler or a stick. And on each side of the ruler, you've got a mass. And these two masses, you allow them to kind of move randomly due to air currents or whatever. You observe the oscillations, random oscillations, and a perfect simulation. They wouldn't move at all. But you've got two uh, weights at the end of you know, this kind of free-floating system. After a time, you introduce a weight like a bowling ball or a concrete block. And you can see that uh, this system, this oscillating system, moves toward that mass and basically sticks to that mass. And we can measure the rate of acceleration and we can plug that in. And we're finding this constant G. And that constant G is the same constant that we're finding when we look at the calculations of what's the mass of the earth, what's the mass of the moon, how do they move, mass of the sun, mass of the earth. And so these astrological phenomenon happen to correspond, their force happens to correspond the same force applying the same constant on this little Cavendish experiment you can do in a, in a high school classroom. So that is kind of the, the scientific angle. You've also got, uh, I think uh, one of the flat earth arguments is you know, if you had this big sun spinning around at a million miles, not actually a million miles an hour, but some astronomically large speed, uh, wouldn't it eventually flatten out like a pancake? Like when you've got your Italians, you know, making the pizza, it tends to flatten out. Um, one of the issues with that is that when we've got bubbles forming, they don't just flatten out. So things as a bubble spins and oscillates in space, it doesn't just flatten out. That is not the sort of natural uh, uh, tendency of bubbles, but rather they form into the spherical shape. And part of that is due to, you know, each of those uh, particles being drawn to the center of mass according to the theory of gravity. So those are kind of the two things I want to bring up. And of course, Flat Earth Aussie is going to bring up a whole bunch of stuff himself that I'll be happy to respond to. Moving on to kind of the 
epistemology, which is just a big word for how do we know what we know? Where do we get our knowledge? Where do we get our authority? Um, we have theology, which tells us what's the nature of God. Does God exist? Does he not exist? Um, you know, how do we know him? Do we know him through the Bible, through the Catholic Church, through ourselves? And I want to ask Flat Earth Ozzy, because I'm curious and I don't know, what is his theological beliefs? Does he purely derive it from empiricism, intuition? Is he some variant of Calvinist? You know, does he believe sola scriptura in the Bible? Um, does he believe in uh, Mother Gaia, the earth goddess or something? You know, what does he believe in? Where does he derive those beliefs? And that goes to a deeper question of um, if he, for instance, says that, well, I get my ideas of all these things simply from empiricism. The problem with pure naive empiricism, which is I walk outside, I look at the earth, looks flat, good enough for me. The problem with that is that all of our knowledge is contained in language and language is not something which is individualistically constructed. All language is collective and it requires authority. So every word that we use is not invented by ourselves, but it's assigned meaning through this collective evolutionary process. You know, every word that we use is not originating with us, but it's borrowed from, you know, this collective emergent authority uh, that is dispersed throughout a hierarchy in our society and evolves over time from, you know, tribal to global societies. So understanding that, I think we have to call into question this sort of naive empiricism that Flat Earth would suggest. Moving lastly to the psychological part, people ask, why, what does deep left mean? Well, there's a lot of meanings to deep left. It's deep. It's, it's a concept with a lot of layers, the political, psychological, spiritual layers. But psychologically, I want to talk about the way in which, um, you know, there is a psychological left type that I personally discovered when I was looking at art. And I was asking this question, why is all art left wing? Now, you might dispute that. And I disputed it as well. And I said, isn't there right wing art as well? Um, but I asked this question, why is there seeming the, this left wing bias in art? And that led me to believe that there are different psychological types of people that end up influencing opinions such as political opinions. And again, we can keep this debate as narrow and focused on, you know, bubbles and Cavendish as we want. But I think we have to step back and realize that a lot of the opinions that we hold and the biases that drive us to rationalize things that we already want to believe due to emotional reasons. So, you know, I want to believe that, um, you know, millions of people aren't lying to me, that, uh, you know, all the airlines and pilots aren't engaged in a conspiracy to hide the flat earth. I want to believe that, you know, people are basically, uh, you know, at least some degree of honest and that uh, something like that is, is not possible. Uh, that's my psychological bias. You know, maybe Flat Earth Aussie has a different psychological bias and I want to explore that. So those are the big three. Um, let me just check where I'm at on time. I didn't set a timer here, but um, those are the big three things. Yeah. I mean, we are currently about 13 minutes into the stream itself. So I think I'm getting around the mark. Um, I really do want to hear more because I could, you know, go off on Spangler, the Magian image of the flat earth cavern uh, that then moves into the Faustian with, you know, the, the globe earth, right? There's that dimension to it as well. I'd like to discuss within sort of the, the psychological component, the cultural component, um, you know, this quest for knowledge, what's under the earth, flat earth Ozzy doesn't care, he's just living life. Uh, the Faustian spirit does care, does care about knowledge and space, infinite space, in fact, exploration. So that, I guess, is kind of the annotation or the asterisk to the psychological component to this. So I think uh, with that, I should cut it off there, wherever I'm at in my time, and give it back to Flat Earth Ozzy. That sounds great. Thank you so very much, Jonko, for your opening statement. And I'm going to now hand it over to Iron for your up to 12 minute opening statement. Well, thank you very much, Amy. And thank you very much, Jonko. That was very interesting. It was not at all what I was expecting, which is interesting because all I do have here is the written word. 
And I do apologize if I go slightly over the allotted time because I would like to read it all and I'm quite happy to let you have extra time if you wanted to go further, if you wanted to as well. So basically I've written down and I'm just going to read it word for word because I'm very good at forgetting stuff. Otherwise, you know, as somebody who loves a bit of a drink, I've got a bit of short-term memory problems at my age, you know, I'm getting old and stuff. <clears throat> so my intro starts with, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. It's always a pleasure to be hosted on Modern Day Debate, the world's leading non-partisan neutral debating platform. My name is Ross Thatcher. I can be found on Quora and Facebook by that name, currently enjoying yet another 30-day stint in Facebook's prejudice prison, thanks to sharing facts about vaccines. I'm now known on YouTube as Iron Horse, formerly known as Flat Earth Aussie Jesus. Iron became the initials of Iron because the initials of Flat Earth, F-E, are the scientific symbol for iron, while my Christian name, Ross, in ancient Teutonic, literally translates as horse. I almost added gold, symbolised as AU, which is also literally a symbol for Australia, but iron gold horse sounded just a little too pretentious, even for me. I'm quite happy for James to continue with the moniker I began this platform with, Flat Earth Aussie, and on that note, I'd like to thank James for inviting me onto this weighty matter, the great gravity hoax, originally intended to be with a popular regular debater. Unfortunately, or otherwise, he was unable to be here today. So I'd like to thank the late Phil in making his debut, a new face on the scene, and we'll see which part of his moniker he lives up to, whether he's a joke or if he's cool. Not that I'm one to make fun of a person's name, nor to attack their person. A cunning linguist like myself places great value on the phonetic vibration of sound, since the vibratory frequency of sound holds more weight than the manner in which it's spelt. Before the invention of the convention of the modern dictionary, it was common to use a multiple of variations to spell a word. And still, despite a consensus of the way a word is spelled, it might still hold multiple definitions, meaning it might mean many different meanings despite having a mean meaning. And I don't mean to be mean, just average. The etymology of a word gives greater insight into how it came into current usage. For example, a word that once meant to be exuberantly happy has now come to apply as a noun for a member of the Homo sapiens species who prefers to copulate with a member of the same biological sex. Now, there's an interesting word too, biological. I wonder if there's such a thing as autobiological, or am I stretching the boundaries of lexicology too far? Lexicology, being the study of linguistics or words, goes hand in hand, platonically speaking, of course, with numerology, which is the study of numbers, which together could be described as the mathematics of language. When Nikola Tesla told us, quote, in order to understand the secrets of the universe, think in terms of frequency in vibration, it reminds us of the power of words. Be here now. Be that amazing insect that makes honey in accordance with the hive mind? Here? Of course I hear them making a buzz. Now? Of course I'll be there in an hour. The phonetic sound is energy, frequency, and vibration, which is why the knowers or Gnostics have reminded us that the pen is mightier than the sword. A sword has might and power, but it's a severing tool, a weapon of destruction. But when Jesus the Christed one allegedly said, I come not to bring peace, but a two-edged sword, he was literally speaking in parables. He knew that words are swords and swords are words, and all words have more than one meaning. The pen is mightier than the sword. We contain animals in a pen. We lock lawbreakers in a pen intentionally, a penitentiary. So what is contained within a simple pen is the eventual potency or potential frequency and vibration of every word in existence. One of my favourite childhood authors also wrote short stories for adults. One particular Roald Dahl story was about an author who picked up a hitchhiker who described himself as a fingersmith. Not just a mere common pickpocket, as he explains, but a true artist in the ways of distract and deceive in order to relieve them of their possessions. The crafty rat-like man, however, upon hearing that the driver was an author, a published writer, well, his respect went up immediately. As one artist respects another, he subsequently dubbed him a wordsmith. Now, most of us are familiar with a blacksmith, but none of us would suggest that he's a master of darkness or things that are black. More likely than not, his moniker originated from his art of working the forge. The subsequent soot and ash from heating and hammering iron in the forge coated him and his clothing with a film of black soot, which is what led, which is what led to the term blacksmith, as opposed to his true art, forger of iron. As much to shod horses as to beat out swords. 
The irony is that his art was done as a forgery. It's possibly where the seeds of Black's law originated. In the art of doublespeak, where the law of deception was masterminded to the point that a defendant facing the irony of the bar required an interpreter to face the charge, often a matter so grave it would be described as a very weighty matter. The scales of justice would weigh the evidence, and in the modern judiciary system, a jury of peers would have to be convinced beyond reasonable doubt if the prosecution had delivered a case sufficient to either incarcerate the charged person to a sentence in a penitentiary for a period, or if in fact the matter was so grave, the weight hanging around his neck was sufficient to sentence the accused to a full stop. Sometimes the charge was as dastardly as copulation outside the sacred bounds of the sacrament of marriage. Known as carnal knowledge, a person found guilty would have his tombstone marked for all of his story to see found under carnal knowledge after being sentenced to his final grave. Eventually, the number of such fornication, fornicators indicated for such a crime grew to such proportions that the overworked stone engravers abbreviated it to simply F-U-C-K, found under carnal knowledge. Those paying final rights to one of the dead soon originated another new word to add to the English vernacular and would say, well, he's F-U-C-K'd. And so we find our way around to the gravity of the matter. Does it matter? Well, if you mind, it matters. If you don't mind, it won't. So what is mind? Do you mind? What does a miner mine? Besides the coal, a blacksmith in flames or ignites in his forge to beat iron into swords or shoes for a horse. If you mind, it matters. It's a state of mind. What's yours is mine. What's mine is mind. Do you possess possessions or do they possess you? That is the grave weight of the matter. The etymological origins of the word gravity comes from the Latin term gravitas, sometimes also gravis. The literal translation of both simply means weight. Thus, we're discussing the weight of matter. My opponent was probably expecting me to focus on the fact that gravity at this stage is just a theory, which indeed it is, but then I expect the usual obfuscation of doublespeak champions to declare that in science, almost phonetically identical to seance, the conjuring of departed spirits or entities, no longer embodied in physical matter, that theory has a completely different meaning from what the average indentured servant slash taxpayer understands it to mean without being mean only average. Hence, we must appeal to the educated interpreter or solicitor of knowledge to give us the Black's Law definition. Yeah, we're getting juicy now. When you ask any scientist, any astrophysicist, what is gravity? They shrug. They honestly admit, we don't know. Next quest, die on. They can tell us what it does, but what is it? It's a simplistic theory words designed to satisfy a young inquiring mind new to the concept of living on the outside surface of a spirit spherical open air planet spinning and hurling through a vacuum of space as to why and how everyone everywhere can always appear to exist on top of the ball and no one is slipping over the edges or dropping off the bottom they called it the force but it wasn't scientific sounding enough Let's use the edumacated words, which, was, which we use everywhere in science, the Latin term gravitas, but they know that means weight. We'll modernize it and call it the weighty matter gravity. What does it matter? Physics, after all, is merely the observation of how physical matter behaves. We'll even write down some of these laws of matter. An object at rest remains at rest unless another force acts upon it. Seems reasonable. The force keeping it at rest must therefore be its own weight or mass. Conversely, we can assume that an object in motion remains in motion unless another force is acted upon it. It can't be gravity, which is the weight of its own mass. The external force that stops it must be friction, restriction, resistance. So now, what is physics? The science of physical matter, the material world. Matter in its own right is inert. It takes a force to resist, to redistribute matter. That force is energy. Let's go back to Tesla. If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. If you mind, it matters. So if an object is in motion, let's say an apple drops from a tree, it will remain in motion unless another force acts upon it. Enter Adolf Neutron. I mean, copper knickers. No, no, no. Uh, arrow toes to the knees. One of them brainiacs anyway, from centuries ago, who was still dipping ostrich feathers in inkwells to scribe the parchment. One of them got beamed by the apple good. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
But what happens when the physical matter of his skull and brains intermediated between the object in motion and not being in motion, a resistance. That apple would, according to the laws of measurable and observable science, lawfully have kept dropping forever, apparently at the rate of 9.81 metres per second squared, at least until another force acted upon it. And what force could that possibly be? Resistance. Resistance due to the physical mass, the density of said mass, of sufficient density to arrest it, to bring it to rest, to make it wait. When you're forced to wait in line, the only thing that compels you to move is your will, your desire, your compunction to burn calories, create a driving force that will move you from your place of rest. Where were you waiting? Why were you waiting? Were you holding mass? What was holding you up? The ground? or the flow of currency from people being charged ahead of you. I think I've said enough to dismiss any hope of my opponent may have to respond to the fact that gravity is a hoax. In the small time space found to run some dirt on him, it seems he's totally politically motivated, has no credentials in either physics or the nature of reality from which physics is but a sub-branch, but he does seem to possess an end game of seeking power. I found it on his link. Go take a look. How do you gain power? Well, you must be charged for it. You charge your phone, your batteries. There needs to be an energy exchange. So when you're seeking power, you are looking to take, not give. A vampire is the end point, the full stop. A river has currency because the banks support it. When the river flows, it gives life to all its constituents. It is the living life force of the veins of the living mother whose very breath we breathe to stay alive whose blood we drink to nurture our blood, whose flesh we consume to sustain our flesh. When we go to the grave, we return back. That's that which she lent to us. Six foot down under, we pile matter or martyr, the mother earth, upon our empty shell so that the seed may grow and join the ancestors in the sky, shining their unique vibratory frequency down upon us. Only in the heliocentric dialect do we require weight or mass to become an invisible force of attraction with no valid description, evidence, or logical explanation. Simply, mass stuff seems to be falling and accelerating at close to 10 meters per second per second. Even nothing is ever observed to double the rate of drop every 10 meters it passes or drops through. It's simply the rate of any mass dropping through the medium of air. Get to a high bridge, drop a baseball and a shot put of equal size, and both hit the water at exactly the same time. Then your magical invisible pulling force gets selective. It gladly pulls the lead ball down to its inky depths, but tells the lightweight ball to go back to the surface now. You've too much hot air in you, but the density of the lead, your god of the gaps gravity kindly welcomes it down. Such a grave matter. If relative density gives some things buoyancy, then surely the only mathematical equation we're required to adhere to is the relative density between an object and the medium it's in. The resistance factor of the medium relative to the density of the object. That's it. The only time we need accept any electrostatic forces of attraction is should you invoke the caveman dish crepolio, where objects suspended will never truly be at rest anyway, nor will fluid air surrounding them, so left to their own manufactured devices, they will eventually come to rest against something which resists them moving any further possibly assisted by an electrostatic charge created from air molecules rubbing off on them. Weird, eh? Rubbing on to get off. What an electrostimulative world we live upon. I'm almost finished. If I'm going to, to a... If I'm going to a... <clears throat> To be a part of a mass debate, I'm going to stop until the money... Sh not going to stop until the money shot. My sword is honed on both edges, but my pen is still about to stab its fatal blow. <laughs> In the philosophy of mass attraction, the pulling force is attributed to the attraction of mass. The greater the girth or width of the earth, the more things of matter are attracted to it. Yet, to prevent them into the sun and the sun being attracted to everything else in the galaxy and every galaxy beyond us, everything colliding back into the singularity which created the Big Bang, well, we have dark matter. Black's law, everything which keeps everything within its place according to the observable laws of density and buoyancy, or to be scientific, relative density and resistance. Looking forward to seeing how Joe Cool can respond to that. Woohoo! Thank you so very much, Iron and Jonkel, for your opening statements. And with that, we are now going to move into an hour. To... 
of open discussion. The floor is all yours, gentlemen. Okay. Awesome. Well, that was very poetic. And I think you're a very skilled poet. I appreciate this kind of discursive thinking where two hours before the debate, you just write a word salad. That's your words, not mine, not uh, not an insult, <laughs> but it's a beautiful, tasty salad. You know, I don't know how much, you know, scientific truth is in there, but there's certainly a lot of you know, energy and emotion. And I can appreciate that. I can appreciate this, uh, this search you have for beauty and words, and you want to view the world in a beautiful way. And, you know, in some ways, I can appreciate that, which is sort of why I brought up earlier, um, this, uh, this Spanglerian example of, of the Magian conception of the world dome. So, you know, when you read the Bible, I think it is pretty clear that the ancient Hebrews did have this concept of a pretty much a flat earth um, with this uh, this heavenly firmament. And there's it's almost like a glass dome with uh, with various planets and stars. And it's it's a beautiful picture. And and maybe this is kind of really going into crazy town but isn't that what minecraft is i don't know if you've ever played minecraft before but i think minecraft is the greatest argument for the flat earth not a scientific argument not an empirical argument obviously but an aesthetic argument an argument that you know wouldn't it be a more beautiful a more simple a more aesthetic world if everything was just flat uh with like these clouds you know above on a ceiling and, you know, everything is kind of contained in this space and it all just seems to make sense. And it, it appeals to us on like a, a basic fundamental level to the point where, you know, you start to wonder, is there something genetically inborn about this belief? Is this something you mentioned, you know, our ancestors in the sky? Uh, that is anthropologically something that we see pop up all over the place, this concept that when we look up at the stars, those are representative of our ancestors. So a lot of the beliefs that you're espousing through your poetry, I think, are important to take note of and not to simply dismiss as idiotic or stupid, but they're important to take note of as for the appeal of their aesthetics, for the, the beauty of the picture that you're forming. And there's a power in that that I think we've forgotten and we've dismissed with science and we've neglected. And sometimes I think when we talk about this concept of ignorance, right, you know, people on my side would say flat earthers are ignorant people. Um, but I also think that the people who just sort of blindly adopt the science without really understanding the, the pull of your position, I think they're also ignorant. They're ignorant of, you know, a, a deep aesthetic, intuitive desire to understand the world. And, and another example I'd give of this would be, you know, Plato's cave, the, the, this cavern that we exist in. It's the self-contained world. Of course, in that example, Plato says there's an outer world, right? There's an outer world outside of the cave. And we need to go into that world. And that is, I would say, to some extent, this proto-Faustian vision of we need to get out of the earth. We need to find out what's under the earth. We need to go into infinite space. So, you know, these two contrasting views of the world are not purely empirical, although, you know, I obviously think there's an empirical reality to one and not the other. But I think there is this deeper emotional, artistic, poetical draw that each of them have. And there's a separate psychology that's going to um, bias us toward these things. I mean, do you, do you feel, for example, do you feel that there are certain people in this world who, you know, are, are more drawn toward the beautiful simplicity of the flat earth. And then there are other people who are sort of these egghead, you know, sciencey uh, nerds or whatever, who, who just follow whatever authority tells them to do. I mean, do you see that at all? Uh, Iron horse. Okay. Well, you've mentioned quite a lot there. So I guess I'll just take you on the last bit because I, I tend to like to, if we're going to argue point for point, we'll just do one little thing at a time. But um, I'm, I'm quite impressed, first of all, the fact that you didn't just go straight into the whole sciencey, sciencey stuff of physics and 
you know, Einsteinian and Newtonian sort of crap because, you know, that's impressive because I, it's the sort of thing I was expecting. And the fact that you were basically talking about the etymology of words was very surprising to me, which I really appreciated. Um, so you're talking about more of a poetic uh, view of how we view reality because, you know, reality just happens to be on this place we call Earth. We've, you know, in the past, we've made many assumptions. All the philosophers and the scientists and so forth have made lots of assumptions of what Earth actually is. But basically, it is just a realm that we live upon. And ideally, the, the whole point of it is, yes, we do want to make it as beautiful as we possibly can. We want to see it in the most simplistic terms because that is what truth is all about. If you have to obfuscate truth in a whole heap of complicated nonsense, then it's probably not true. That's how you you tell the greatest lies is by obfuscating it the most. That's what the you know William of Ockham was all about. You know, the most simple, direct explanation for a thing with the least convoluted assumptions is more than likely the truth. And so that's how we have this Ockham's razor of what is truth. And yeah, I think that the flat earther has generally he he was he started off as a globe believer. He was a full on heliocentrist and he fully believed it, at least in my case. I absolutely fully believe the whole heliocentric view of the universe, of our existence, of us living on this special little spinning blue ball hurtling through space. And then the more and more I looked into it, the more I just realized, you know, none of these things are adding up. You know, what observable parts of those assumptions can we prove in the classroom, in the laboratory, in reality? You know, I've got winds wafting around me. These winds are the atmosphere. But they were told that this atmosphere is moving with the Earth. No, no, it's moving completely independent of the Earth. In fact, you know, the Earth doesn't seem to be moving at all. And there's nothing scientific that we can do, no instrument that can detect motion of the Earth. So we have to rethink things and say, well, the, the whole idea of an atmosphere moving with the Earth through a vacuum of space and the only thing that holds it together is this invisible pulling force called gravity which is what we're here to discuss today and this pulling force of gravity makes no sense in any observable uh, experiment that we can do for example the hammer throw event in the olympic games we can swing a weight around and around on a string and the minute we let it go it flies off in a straight direction it does come crashing back down to the earth and we could attribute that to gravity, but that's not how gravity works. It's basically the lack of resistance of air, which for eventually causes the weight to overcome that, or the resistance of air to overcome the weight to eventually cause it to come back down. And it happens pretty quickly, you know, within a few hundred meters at the most, I'm sure. I'm not sure of the world's record of it. But the whole idea of everything outside of the Earth, they're said to orbit as though they're on a string in perpetual motion and that is obviously completely everything against physics as we can observe and practice so all it comes down to is basically that the heliocentric belief and the belief in gravity that is probably the most indoctrinated religious belief in all the history of mankind and to believe in that basically i think means that you're you've been brainwashed into believing something that doesn't exist but you're told to make to believe in it because otherwise the whole model falls apart. Okay, yeah. I will try to keep it to one point, you know, at, per your request. Um, the first point I would want to make would be about cars. So you say that, um, how can it be that the winds around me are, are moving independently of the earth if they're also supposed to be traveling with the earth? The example I would give is I can be in a car that's driving 70 miles an hour down the highway. At the same time, I can move my hands back and forth. I can climb from the front seat to the back seat. I can jump in the car, you know, so I can move about independent from the motion of the car while the car is moving. Um, you know, and, and that's basically how the atmosphere, the atmosphere is like this amorphous gaseous passenger in the car that is the rotating earth. And, you know, when uh, we're in a car and it's driving 70 miles an hour, we can't feel the speed of the car. We can feel it accelerate if it, someone slams on the gas or slams on the brake. But if it continues at a consistent speed, we're not going to feel 
the movement of the car. We can feel if someone pushes us in the car or something else happens, but it's the same thing with us moving around the earth. You mentioned uh, the fact that there's no device that can detect the movement of the uh, last point, no device that can detect the movement of the earth. And I think you're probably referring to like seismographs or something that, that measure uh, earthquakes, right? But again, this is relative. So if you take a seismograph into a car and the road is perfectly smooth, the seismograph isn't going to measure uh, the speed of the car. If you slam on the brakes or the gas, it'll measure the acceleration. But once you're at a consistent velocity, relatively speaking, there's no force being applied to you with respect to the vehicle. And our vehicle is the earth. Well, I've never heard of anybody ever taking a seismograph onto a moving car for that matter. It was usually they're set up. In okay, well, you can look it up after this debate. Yeah, for sure. But they're obviously a very, very, very sensitive instrument, which is designed to detect the slightest vibrations of the earth, which is why a seismograph can detect an earthquake from hundreds and hundreds of miles away and even tell you what scale on the Richter that it is. So um, I think they're two completely different things. When you're talking about the motion of a car, then, um, yeah, the car has a windscreen. It has doors and windows and a roof that's fully enclosed. Nowhere in the, on the earth hurtling through a vacuum of space do we have the advantage of such a thing as a windscreen, doors, windows and a roof over us, you know, assuming that we're even moving in the first place. So that's a non sequitur. They don't even compare to one another. That there's nothing the same. And people bring this one up all the time. But what I would like to suggest is if, say, you're able to do it in a very large truck or train carriage, but make it so that the, the height of this truck or train carriage is very, very high. And I'd like to see if you're traveling at 70 miles per hour, if, in fact, if you threw a ball up in the air sufficiently high enough, even though that air is still moving with you, if it would actually fall back to you or if it would hit the back of the wall. I'm telling you, to the best of my knowledge, I think it would hit the back of the wall because you are moving beneath that ball and that ball is not still traveling with the same inertia you threw it up with, which it has a slightly forward velocity above, you know, a couple of feet. And that's the best you get in a plane or a train or in a car is a couple of feet. And that's not sufficient to see enough distance. You know, you'll eventually soon learn just to throw it a little bit further forward so that it lands straight back in your hands. That's where inertia fails because if you remove the lid of your car and you threw the ball up a few feet, it will immediately fall behind you. And people will always say, yeah, well, wind resistance. But hang on, the earth is moving. The wind, how can the earth be moving different from the car and, and still take the wind with it if it doesn't have that windshield effect? You know, the earth should be moving through that very same wind and in a vacuum of space, I'm sorry, but there's nothing to contain that air. That air is wafted off behind you like a huge comet tail immediately. And we'd lose all our water as well. We'd, we'd lose it immediately. You know, water boils in a vacuum at room temperature. You just can't have the combination of both. You can't have the uncontained earth in a vacuum and have, you know, be on the outside. You know, what engineer would ever, ever in their right minds design a spaceship where the inhabitants sit on the outside without a spacesuit. Nobody ever. So how can it be possible that we're on the open air of an organic spinning space ball in a vacuum of space? It's just not even possible to begin with. Okay, so in the example of the car, you're basically saying that if I have the top down, I can feel the wind on my face, that there's this resistance of the wind, and, you know, how is it possible with the earth, you know, and the earth is revolving around the sun, you know, how is it possible that everything is contained? Well, the reason is because when I'm in a convertible with the top down driving my car, uh, there is wind, there is air, there is atmosphere that is resisting me, that's pushing against me that I can feel if we could you know, drive a car on a road that had no atmosphere, we would not feel any resistance. And it would actually be quite eerie because it would feel like we really weren't moving at all. Again, assuming a perfectly smooth uh, road. You mentioned that a seismograph, um, that's completely different. You know, it, it measures very slight vibrations. 
but you can adjust that quantitatively, right? It's not a qualitative difference to say, I'm going to measure vibrations at a small level that according to earthquake, Richter scale, and then adjust that uh, to then detect motion on another scale. So, yeah, I mean, the fact that the earth is, you know, revolving around the sun through a vacuum means that there's no resistance. There's no, there's no outside atmosphere air resistance that our earth and our atmosphere is encountering. So as we're moving through space, it's as if, you know, we're passing through nothing. And, and it would be the same thing as if, if you were driving your car with no air, no atmosphere, no resistance, you wouldn't feel like you're resisting anything. One of the questions I'd like to ask you related to this is, you know, you're saying that you're talking about balls in the air and density of the air and the resistance of the air. Are you saying that if there was no air at all, or just that the air was thin, because maybe you don't, you think vacuums are impossible. Let's say we're up in very thin air on the top of a mountain. If I drop a ball on, on the top of a mountain, is that ball going to instantly hit the ground because there's, there's no air resistance, or at least is it going to be proportional? You know, so if I say I'm on top of Mount Everest, there's half the amount of oxygen up here. If I drop a ball, should it drop, you know, twice as fast? Well, well, that's exactly where you've got your whole mistake. Um, in a nutshell, like everybody, there's a bloke in the um, the chat was asking me before this started. You know, why, if the air is less dense above us, do things fall down? Shouldn't they be falling up? But the point is, resistance comes from more density. It doesn't come from less density. So if something is less dense above a thing of matter, a thing of weight, with mass, weight, and volume, then it naturally seeks downwards. That is the first law of science is you observe what is happening. What are all our observations saying? A thing of mass falls down. We, we don't have any say in that. That's just what it does. And when it stops, it's stopped because of a place of resistance. So if you've got even thinner air, less and less dense air, it's giving even less resistance. So it will actually fall slightly faster until it suddenly reaches the air and then it suddenly gets some air resistance because of its shape and resistance factor and then it'll reach a terminal velocity. But it won't stop because air doesn't offer sufficient resistance, unlike the ground. So when it hits the ground, bam, that's where your maximum resistance is going to be. And so the earth itself, if it was moving through a vacuum, it is the, the thing of resistance. And it would be pushing itself straight through the atmosphere. It wouldn't give a damn about the atmosphere. All the air would be on the backside of the Earth. And it's spinning once every 24 hours. But it's also speeding around the sun, as you say, orbiting the sun. It's going 65 times faster than it is spinning on its axis. So you've got a combination of two different factors of it hurtling along at 67,000 miles per hour, spinning at 1,000 miles per hour, and... The air, obviously, it's going to go to the place of least resistance, which is the vacuum. You have to have a container to contain gases. You can't go up to the to the gas station or you know somewhere to fill up your gas bottle and say, oh, well, I don't need a bottle. Gravity can be my container. That stuff is going to dissipate and spread out. You need a container to contain gas, assuming that we are in space which my last um, debate here was all about whether or not we are in space, and obviously we're not. The stationary plane of Earth is at the bottom of the known universe. It's the only physical plane of existence, and everything, including the air molecules, the water molecules, the physical stuff, it all finds its place according to the observable and repeatable logical laws of density and buoyancy. And in that very rare incidents where you do something like the Cavendish experiment, where you've suspended some weights from strings so that they're sort of balanced, they're never going to be perfectly still. They're always going to be just the tiniest little bit of movement. You can't tell. I, I made one note about that. You said a perfect simulation. And yes, in a perfect simulation in a computer, that would technically be correct because you haven't got reality of physics affecting something in a simulation. In reality, we do have air, and air is a fluid, 
and the air molecules are constantly in motion and they will eventually impart some amount of electrostatic charge to any object, especially if it's plastic or whatever. And eventually these things will come to rest against one another. And that is not proof of gravity because what that is saying is that the gravity of the earth, which is like a million billion times stronger than the gravity of a bowling ball, that this little thing is going to overcome the gravity of the earth to be attracted to the bowling ball or the cement block, as you put it. I've never heard it that way before. But that is not is how that would not be how gravity works. This pull of gravity of the earth would always be stronger, and that thing would never be attracted to the larger ball. So it's another beautiful flat earth proof of the fact that everything in motion is eventually going to come to rest at something that will resist it. And then it will stay at rest until another force acts upon it. <laughs> Cavendish okay, and, experiment. Yeah, and the, okay. In the Cavendish experiment, the force of gravity is pulling those suspended weights downward. There is no uh, rotational force outside of random oscillations from air currents. When you place a uh, weight like a bowling ball or cement block, you can have uh, vectors. I don't know. Have you ever heard of vectors before in physics? Force vectors, right? So while something like a cannonball, right? A cannonball can be vectors everywhere. Yeah, yeah. So when a when a cannonball is shot out of a cannon, there's a force vector that is driving it. Let's say north. It's shot due north, but at the same time, there's a gravitational force bringing it downward. So you can have multiple forces in multiple directions at the same time. Um, with regard to this question of how can the atmosphere be contained on the earth? Why doesn't it all just dissipate? And you gave the example of, you know, you go to the grocery store and you get a beverage and it's contained within some kind of plastic or glass. Now that glass no, is bound together, right? It's bound together. It's a solid. And the, those, the, the fragility of that glass is the strength of that glass to contain the liquid or the gas. If I heat up that liquid or gas, it's going to expand. And ultimately, that expansion force can overcome the strength of the container. And so in any time we talk about containment, the phenomenon is we have a force which is counteracting the natural and tropic expansionary force of a liquid or a gas. That is, you know, water wants to reach the lowest point, air wants to disperse into a vacuum. And so in the case of the earth, it's actually the gravitational force that acts as that containing force. Now it's not perfect in the sense that if you go to the highest layer of our atmosphere, yes, uh, there is a little bit of atmosphere that's kind of floating off into space. There's a, a minuscule amount when you reach that limit. But of course here on earth, it's close enough that it is basically contained by you know its own weight with respect to the gravitational pull of the earth as well as the weight of all the atmosphere that's above it for miles and miles so gravity so i just have to ask you then what is gravity that is a great question that is a great question and it's one that we would like to know more about. And I think we can all admit oh. that we don't know everything. Like you don't know what's on the bottom of the earth. If you knew what was on the bottom of the earth, that would really help flesh out this flat earth theory and give it some, you know, credentials. But, you know, you don't, you say you're disinterested. I am interested in, in the mechanism that creates gravity. We know that gravity is related to distance and mass, but what exactly is it? And in order to understand where gravity proceeds from, we have to understand the nature of mass. And so what is mass? Is it a particle? Is it a wave? Um, you know, how deep are we going to go into this? Do you believe in the atomic theory? Uh, you know, do you think all of that is made up? I mean, obviously, atomic theory has been further pushed into quarks and then even further into theoretical string theory. So there's a lot of things that we don't know. And as humans with limited abilities for perception, when we're getting to these small scales, we're having to use instruments and devices that in the process of our measurements, we're actually affecting the matter we're trying to measure and therefore 
you know, you're, you're getting this kind of observation problem of in order to observe an electron um, and it, to observe its, its uh, location or its speed, I'm going to actually be modifying those things at the same time. So that would be a question for you. Do you believe in the atomic model? That, that was basically the answer. So the earth is ageless, Top, man has always existed. And this whole concept of 6,000 years ago, that's just somebody's record of it after their particular reset. Man, Top, has, man always has always been, existed and will always be. And that's all right, right, guys, we this is going to be our second half. Welcome everyone back to Modern Day Debate. We are in the open discussion of is gravity fake? We're about halfway through it. And so I'm handing the balls back over to Jockel <laughs> and Iron. Handing the balls back over. That's really That's cool right. of you. I was in the middle of having a rant actually and it was Jockel who uh, explained to me that we've We've gone into lockdown, you know, we're in the middle of a COVID situation here. Massive lockdown. So I had no idea what train of thought I was in at the, the time. I'm sure he would remember because he's much younger than I am, much better good looking. And so he will have a much better memory of the questions he was asking me, which I was in the middle of going in a massive rant about answering. And over to you, Jocko. Yeah, we did get quite off topic in the, you know, there's like a debate debate format that we have to follow and we have to be enemies and whatnot and that's all part of the the game here on youtube but we got uh we got a little bit off topic there so i have to get back into adversarial combat mode we have to fight for uh for the audience here um <laughs> let me let me try to uh get we got into a couple of things about the age of the earth um you you basically mentioned and i i want to try to tie this together so i don't want to just say like oh well let's just talk about anything but i really want to get to something that you mentioned which was you know what is gravity you don't even know what it is um and we could continue to ask that about a number of things you could say well what really is a force what really is mass what really is energy you know when it comes down to it we can we can kind of socratically question what is the meaning of these concepts what ultimate grounding do they have um is it possible that we can simply in your case just say like air has density density means things fall downward that's all that's going on a simple occam's razor or in my case it's gravity is a force it pulls things according to mass and distance, simply what it is. There might be something deeper to it. I just don't know, but that's as much as I know. I, you know, if people have theories about gravitons and bending space time and whatnot, and um, whatever mechanism it is, uh, you know, it's like there are these forces and, you know, things do exist. And the question is like, at what point can we be satisfied in a truth? At what point can we be satisfied in a knowledge? And, and the example of why I'm bringing this up is you said something like, you know, off camera, you said the earth is ageless and men are ageless. And this is going back to what I introduced in part one, kind of related to um, a civilizational worldview, right? Um, that in a you know, Magian worldview, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, there is a beginning and an end. There's a certain teleology, a soteriology of salvation. We, we start at a certain place, we go through a certain fall or trial, and then it's like a three act play. We end up um, at the end, you know, with some kind of transformation. But when you suggest that things are just sort of endless and ageless, without a beginning, without necessarily an end, um, you know, that same question of grounding comes to mind. It's like, well, you know, where's the ground of these things? At what point do we say, you know, this is simply is what it is and we're not going to question it further, um, you know, or at what point do we say maybe there's some kind of 
underlying mechanism. Maybe there's some kind of, um, you know, further truth that we need to investigate. What, what's your take on that? Oh, well, I think the quest of knowledge is never going to end. We're never going to have all the answers to everything. And if we do, if we reach such a stage of enlightenment, you know, that there's, it's an interesting word, the word light itself, you know, to become light means less than heavy. And what is heavy? Well, that's the weight of things. So there's, there's like the, the two spectrums of things, light and darkness or enlightenment and grave, the grave, you know, like if you become enlightened enough, I think eventually over a period of time is that hu even humanity reaches a point of, of mass consciousness where they become enlightened and they raise to a higher vibrational level. And then meanwhile, we've got this particular level, this plane our earth that we're on. This is the physical plane. This is where star seeds get planted to see whether they make it or not to become a star. And so literally we're sent down here to be tested, to be tried, to, to be stuck down into the soil of this matter to see if we're capable of reaching a stage you know, uh, uh, the, the vibrational intelligent conscious stage you know we, we can easily exist as monkeys and you know and stealing off one another and do all things but as soon as we invoke rules and laws and things which make society a better place and then we strive to make this world a better place then we have a purpose. You know, our purpose then is not just to survive. It's not just to be better than other people and be smarter than them or to show them off, but yeah, you know, show them up in a debate. You know, I've got no intentions of doing that with anybody. All I'm hoping to do is plant seeds that will make people strive to want to do something better, to make the world a better place. And the way I see the world being a better place is, well, what are our basic requirements? Water, air, good earth, <laughs> and a bit of fire, a bit of energy. You know? So those things combined do combine to give us a better quality of life. And if we control them consciously, we can make the world a better place. So, you know, sure, we can just go out and plant some seeds in the field and a certain percentage of them might survive. But if we do it with intelligence, that's, that's our purpose in life is to apply our intelligence, our inborn intelligence, which is what our purpose is, to apply intelligence to improving things in a better way, to make things better. And that's why, you know, a genius, for example, will invent a better invention, something that will make the world easier for people to, to move on with. So we don't have to spend half our time out in the field pulling weeds or plowing or whatever. We can spend more time applying our intelligence to higher aspects of life, which is the finer arts, whether it be, you know, for beauty purposes or whether it be for something that is a, a functional purpose. But that is the purpose of life. And I think that we go through these resets. Like if we look into our not so distant past and we look at some of the things that the people were able to do, like, you know, they built pyramids. Okay, that's a fair long time ago. But they had carvings in solid marble and we expect to believe they use a chisel and a hammer to carve these intricate like fish nets and hair and absolute beauty of things just by carving it no because we're thinking with the wrong frame of mind they had an advanced technology or understanding of the matter of things the way matter works and i believe that that's why we get these resets every so often because what happens is all these people they reach a state of consciousness they no longer need to exist here in this physical plane. And so what happens is they all just go up to a higher dimension. And then meanwhile, we're left with a bunch of orphans with no idea what's going on. We've got orphan trains of people going everywhere. Oh, you know, we're, we're looking at this ma major architecture and we're supposed to believe these people were doing this with the horse and buggy type days. But as you look at the places they were living in, they're just bloody little tiny wooden huts and yeah, you know, if you're lucky, they had tin, if they could even evolve that far. But we've got these massive, grandiose buildings that have been around for centuries upon centuries. So I think that 
yes, mankind has always existed and we reach a certain stage. And then what we do, we, we run out of things that are interesting. So we just do another reset. And that's why we come back again and we go, hmm, that was fun. But, you know, I've run out of fun. I've got to do it again. And so to me, that's the, the whole mind of God, if you want, if you wish to use such a term, is that if God knew everything, then what is the point of its existence? It would be bored shitless. As I, oh, I know everything. What's some little loophole I can find that I can put myself into to go and make life interesting again? Oh, I know. I'll just be born as a newborn baby and discover everything all fresh again. That's what I think is the purpose. All right. One of the things you said in there was about fire being energy. Is that just a metaphor or is all energy in the universe reducible to what you call fire? Uh, energy is just a word. Energy is just a, a term that human of invention. And generally we apply it to something that's of matter transforming faster then it usually transforms. I mean, you can make a compost pile and things break down slowly, but if you light a fire, then that breakdown of things happens quite energetically. And so we apply that term energy. But basically everything is, you know, I guess even Einstein told us that um, it's matter times the speed of light squared. So everything is in a state of transformation. It's... um. Yeah, I wouldn't say that fire is the only state of transformation. It's just one of them. I just asked because before you said that you follow the Greek model or what I understand to be the Greek model with earth, fire, wind, um, and uh, air. So I was wondering, you know, do you believe, because, you know, the Greeks believe that each of those elements, you know, had its own characteristics and that they combined uh, in various ways to make up, you know, matter and phenomena. Um, so I was wondering if you believe that fire is, you know, that, that basically any motion at all is the result of tiny little fire, which is basically what the Greeks believed, or if you think those two things are, if you think there's a, something separate called energy, which is separate from fire, that maybe fire is a particular phenomenon of it um, as it relates to gravity because when or, or density, you know, when we're thinking of things falling, is that what mechanism is that due to? Is that due to little fires propelling things downward or is uh, what exactly, what is the mechanism of density? You know, you've stated that things just kind of fall down because they're heavier than air. But, you know, what's the mechanism? What's propelling? Okay, them well, that's a pretty convoluted question you asked there. Okay, you know, yeah, let me you, simplify you it for you. Greeks. Like in my model, there's, there's oh, gravity. I've got this, it's okay. You had your chance. Um, you, you, you mentioned the earth, air, fire, and water, which I was describing before as the four elementals of life. And when the four of those things combine, which is, you know, earth, physical matter, air, which is the gases, the, the breath of life, um, earth, air, fire, um, that's the energy, the electrical energy of life, and water, well, that is the, the gift of love, that is love manifest, that is what I believe water is. So those four energies combined give this the fifth element, which is life. So all living matter require those four elements of earth, air, fire, and water. And with the right combination and the right balance of things, you can stay alive for a very long time. So you then try to invoke the, the energy of fire. So like if, if we were trying to ask a, an astrophysicist, what is electricity? We'll get the same answer as what is gravity. They'll be saying, uh, I don't know. It's just a, it's another force. It's a force that we can, we can tap into. We can run it through electrical wires. But when we ask what it is, we don't know. It's just another force. It's a natural force, the living force, the same thing that makes our hearts tick and the conduits, you know, everything inside of our brains tick over together. And electricity is basically another one of the workhorses of the universe. You know, it's 
almost like a vortex energy, which is the way water works, the way air works. And when it comes to earth, well, that's another matter altogether because that is matter. That is matter. So when you're asking what you then try to bring it into what makes things fall down, well, down again is a human construct. We have got three basic elements in this three-dimensional world, which are called the X, Y, and Z axis. We've got you know, the forwards and backs. We've got the left and right, no matter what else you want to call them as, and you've got the up and down. And these are universal directions created in the mind of man to try and comprehend the realm upon and within which we live. And you will notice you can do any sort of experiment. You can lift up any object and let it go, and it will always go down. And that downward vector is simply the fact of matter is more material it is more dense, it is greater than the medium within which you change it. If you left it on the ground, it won't move. It will stay there. But you apply a force to it. So when you apply a force to an object, it will react to that force. And the dropping thing is just a reaction. If you didn't move it, it would stay there. So all of these things that we see, the up-down movement of things, is just a reaction of something applying it at different force to it everything would stay static and wouldn't move at all if we didn't apply that force in the first place and that's pretty much what newton was trying to tell us that an object at rest stays at rest and an object in motion will stay in motion unless another force acts upon it and that force is resistance and that resistance comes from relative density of whatever it comes across and air having very little resistance lets it drop through it ground having a lot of resistance stops it, it arrests it, it brings it to rest. That's the whole story of gravity. That's the weight of the matter. You say that, uh, you know, there's earth, which is the most dense, and then you've got water, which is less dense, air, which is the least dense. Well, I guess I think in the Greek system, fire was the least dense. Um, but in any case, you know, what do you think of, changes in state you know so you know water as a solid as ice you know water as steam as gas um and other elements as well i mean don't, don't you see like when you're saying that certain things are inherently more dense or less dense like that and there's basically only four elements you mentioned i mean your name fe right iron isn't aren't there more elements than just those four and the do you reject the periodic table no of course not you know the the, the elements of earth themselves as they came to be called you know elementary dear what's what's on you know there's what's and what's on that you know i think uh sherlock holmes had a lot to say about that you know but basically of course the 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 earth can be called elements if you want to break them into that but originally there's just those four elements that's how things started and yeah of course we, we can break down the constituents the and if you want to use the word atomic or molecular weight yeah i'm okay with that because every different element within that periodic table you know, it's only periodic it's it's always in a constant fluctual change but generally speaking these things are um, constants and all these things have an atomic weight or a molecular weight and that is what dis defines their density like if we start with hydrogen it's the least dense then we've got helium that's slightly more dense and that's why we have this gradient of density through things until we reach solids and when the solids are solid, well, they're sort of immovable. Yeah, you know, I think the most dense liquid thing at normal room temperature would be mercury. But as you mentioned with ice, well, ice is basically just the temperature of water. But contrary to that too, or ironically even, um, when you heat it up, it also expands. And that is the basis of how a hot air balloon works in the density of the medium of air. So if it's really nice and cool air and you inflate a balloon and you heat up all the air inside that balloon, it will rise up. So it becomes an anti-gravity device. It's actually one of the, the greatest um, 
arguments against gravity is that it's just relative density. And my next best one, of course, is the siphon, but it's so simple. I won't even go into that at the moment because we're just talking about temperature of things. So the temperature means volume and the mass per that volume. And so because hot air expands, it creates in the cold air environment, because the cold air is fluid, it will allow that balloon to rise up to a certain point. And then as the external air heats up to a similar uh, condition, due to sunlight and whatnot, it starts coming back down again. Whereas with ice, it's cold and it does expand, but it's too cold and it becomes a solid, and a solid does not rise in a um, medium of air. But if you had ice on liquid water, the ice floats. So it's the same sort of thing. It's still a density and buoyancy thing. It's the same molecular construct, but the temperature of it, when it's uh, cold enough, it will float on the water and in air, it does the opposite thing. So basically we've got this sea level, sea level, and that is the plane upon which we live. And all of earth is measured as above sea level. All of air is measured above sea level as its gradient. And as you go down underneath the sea, you have a greater pressure gradient because you've got more of it pressing down on you. It's, it's, I think it's that is physics 101, is the amount of things, the temperature of things, the density of things, the relative density of one thing relative to another thing. That explains why everything finds its place. So do you believe that water is composed of oxygen and hydrogen? Apparently so, because you can apply electrolysis to it and extract both those gases from it but um as far as calling it h2o i think that's an oversimplification i think water itself is a unique compound in its own right in fact you know if you really look into things um as far as i look into it as you know earth air fire and water these things are angels they're not um separate well they're not um it's, it's hard to explain, but each and every one of them in their own right exists unique unto itself. And so water, which can take on memory and whatnot, I don't believe it. You can simplify it into its chemical compounds just because you can extract some of them from it. I believe there's far more to it. Things that we may not ever know in this particular existence, but... I mean, it's okay. All right. I mean, that's that's a pretty big question then it's like how even logically does that make sense to say that yes while water can be you know made up of hydrogen oxygen at the same time it can't be it's it's got to be its own thing through a mystery i mean that sounds like you're just asserting that because to you water is love and i mean that's a powerful metaphor again poetically i'm i'm on board with you i love the, the poetic image of water is love. And in fact, you know, biblically water is life. And so there's a lot of historically images of water as um, a metaphor for uh, a flowing and, and something that you can't quite grasp, something you can't quite capture. Like what is love? You know, uh, it, it's like water. It's like you, you, you try to put your hand in the ocean, you try to take it, grasp it with your hand, it just slips out of your hand. And so there's a lot of metaphors about water and love that I think are very interesting and, and worth examining psychologically and, and poetically. Um, and I, so I understand, I guess, your commitment to that metaphor, but I guess I question if that is a reason to then take that into the realm of science. I almost, I would be happier for you to just say, I don't care what science is. I don't care what electrolysis is. I'm actually surprised you didn't just say electrolysis is a conspiracy, you know, made up by the same scientists who invented space and all the other nonsense, right? So I, I'm, I'm even surprised by that. Like, so I think you should just be consistently, you know, electrolysis is fake, gravity is fake, space is fake. Just ignore all of it and just stick with what is poetical. That would be consistent to me, don't you think? Yeah, well, that's a really uh, humorous way of looking at things. 
Uh, only because, you know, the things which are noticeably fake, such as the invisible pulling force of mass, you know, well, that is obviously fake because otherwise we'd be getting stuck to the wall all the time, you know. Like the Cavendish experiment, oh, the ground isn't strong enough to hold us down. That freaking wall, oh, it's sucking me to it. Bam! Oh, shit, that hurt. You know, it, that, there are certain things which we know to be truisms. And when it comes to water, that is one of those things that, which we know we can do electrolysis in water. It's one of my favourite uh, side um, interests at the moment is to try and create uh, hydrogen so that I can create a, um, a, a type of free energy vehicle that can waft around through the air using the power of wind to actually drive it into the wind. This is one of my side, you know, things that I think about all the time. So, of course, I believe in the things that can be observed and repeated and tried for yourself and experimented with. Yes, we can extract hydrogen out of water. Yes, it does make a big boom, boom if we light it. It's one of those things. And the more oxygen you add to it, the more it goes boom, boom. But if you try and light water, it don't go boom, boom. So how can it just be H2O on its own? There's something stopping it from going boom, boom every time you put a, a lighter to it. But you separate those two things and then you combine them back together, kaboom, you've got a hydrogen bomb. It's you know, there, there are so many things in science that we simply do not know and are still discovering. And we're basically, I think, in a very much an iron age, <laughs> pardon the pun, uh, as far as understanding how these things work. We, you know, we're just touching upon it. We're at the forefront now of this knowledge of the way matter actually works and interacts with one another. We've been, been using electricity very crudely through electrical wires for, for the last like 100 years, whereas back in the day, it's it's suggested that they had free energy. There was free lighting and free heating everywhere. With It was all wireless. Uh, but we don't understand a, a part of that. You know, I think Nikola Tesla was trying to, to hint us upon how it all works, but he was just regard, disregarded as some cra crazy, loony you know, crackpot by the people who controlled the media. The media tells the people how to think and where have we been for this last hundred years we've been told how to think by the media they are the ones controlling our minds mind control mind control what is control to govern to govern the the mind what is the mind mental mentality so government is controlling our minds and they've been doing this for so long and we are the result of Countless, at least three to four, maybe longer generations of mind control who are telling us what to think, how to think, and who to disregard as a crackpot conspiracy theorist. And Nikola Tesla is possibly one of the greatest scientists of our modern time. And we're told to worship this freaking guy called Einstein who told us vent times and space gives us um, things that stick together and uh, gravity. You know, like it's crazy, but we still believe it because that's what we're taught in the schools. I didn't get taught about Tesla in school. Were you taught about Tesla in school? Yeah, Tesla was brought up. I mean, we didn't necessarily, you know, look at his plans for infinite energy as, you know, something that was realistic. But I mean, that was mentioned. Um, I did want to ask you about the concept of combustion, what you believe the mechanism of combustion is, because you basically have said that, you know, hydrogen can combust. Um, you know, I think, I, I hope you admit that oxygen is necessary for combustion, but, you know, water doesn't combust. So, you know, how would you explain combustion? Is it, is it gas elements transforming into fire elements or, what exactly is that process, in your opinion? I don't really have a um, professional opinion about that. It's something that, that happens if you apply a spark. You know, without the spark, which is the energy, which is some sort of electrical energy, then that combustion just won't happen. You know, you can let the, heli uh, the, the hydrogen and the oxygen waft off back into the air from which it came, which is air, as far as I'm concerned, it's just a gaseous form of water and liquid petroleum gas. If you put that into a bottle, you've got an empty bottle, but it's a solid container. And the more you compress that into it, 
say you just filled it half full or whatever, you can then, or you you use it up in your barbecue for propane uses. And then you can shake that bottle. You can hear the liquid inside of it. So obviously gas, when sufficiently compressed, will turn into a liquid. And so what I'm thinking is what water is, is sufficiently compressed air. And, you know, it's, it's in a, a volatile state. It's constantly turning into air again into vapor and creating clouds and then it returns back down and becomes water again it's i I don't really think that this whole idea of um being able to burn or you know to ignite the gases that they are necessary for the combustion of other gases and on their own they will ignite but what that is it's a bit like when you ask Neil deGrasse Tyson, what is gravity? We don't know, but we can tell you what it does. And what it does is it burns. So, yeah, there's a lot of things we don't know. Okay, well, you know, we do know why hydrogen is combustible and water isn't. It's because combustion is a reaction uh, with oxygen, you know, so the spark that you're talking about, this initial energy that is causing a chain reaction in the hydrogen, um, with oxygen, releasing energy, different energy states related to electron valence fields. So, you know, you're just kind of boldly proclaiming here that we have no clue the mechanism of combustion. There's no explanation for it. It's just like, you know, water doesn't, hydrogen does. It's one of the great mysteries of life. We actually do have an explanation for it, um, you know, and... Well, can I just add that for a second? You, you just Go said ahead. that hydrogen combines with oxygen, it creates fire. But no, it doesn't because it's water. No, I didn't say that. I, I mentioned that if you have a spark, what puts out the spark you're talking about. If you have enough energy... Right. So if you introduce energy, so you can do this, um, you know, I I guess the comic book example is you have a barrel full of gasoline and you shoot it. Um, Although in all actuality, that's not necessarily going to make it explode. Um, But if you if you have some kind of energy, some kind of initial energy, whether it's electrical energy or whether it's, you know, uh, a small bit of fire or whatever that is, if you have some kind of introduction of energy, also heat energy, right? So if you have a stove top, if you have heat is sufficient enough heat, you can light a piece of paper on fire. What is that combustion? Well, the, the paper is hydrocarbons. It's these chains of hydrocarbons that are then combusting, they're igniting. Water doesn't do that, right? Yeah, so you, water- You cannot burn water. You, cannot burn water. That's right. you can boil a pot of water, but that water will not boil. What you just said, yeah, you've introduced paper, but we're talking about water here. We're talking about H2O. Right. That's that, This is what yeah. I'm trying to explain is that water doesn't catch fire because water is composed of it is H2O. And so it's not reacting with oxygen in the same way that flammable materials are. So when we talk about a uh, paper, it's hydrocarbons. When we talk about oil, we're talking about hydrocarbons. When we're yeah. talking about hydrogen gas, right? We're, we're talking about substances that are um, basically conducive to reacting with oxygen given an initial you know, spark of energy, whether that's coming from heat, electricity, or whatever. Yeah, but, um, so, it, so you're implying, though, that if, if lightning hit water, that's energy, that's fire. Right, this water. is what I'm that's trying to do. You're, you're making my point for me. You're making my point, which is that the whole um, when, is that what you're saying? No, no this, this is the point I'm trying to make is that that uh, water, because it is H2O, is going to interact with oxygen much differently than hydrogen. And it's going to interact with oxygen much differently than hydrocarbon. So things that are flammable, things that can bust, are able to react with oxygen but because h2o you know is is not reactive with oxygen in that way we say it's not combustible it doesn't produce fire fire is you're you're essentially having in the case of hydrocarbons 
the reaction is that you have hydrogen bonded to, to carbons and that then it reacts with oxygen. And the result is it takes, it, it, it takes away the oxygen and it puts out CO2. So the carbon bonds to the oxygen, creating CO2. And then you have this ash residue, but it takes up oxygen. And, and you can see this with a candle, right? If you have a candle and you put a, a glass over your candle and you cut off its oxygen supply, supply it, the fire will go out because it needs that oxygen. Similarly, the reason why we breathe in oxygen, we exhale CO2 is actually because combustion is going on inside our body in the metabolic process. Now it's not a, a, a fire on the grand scale of a, of a big piece of wood on fire, but on a molecular scale, that's what's going on. So, you know, an understanding of these kinds of like basic, you know, ninth grade biology type facts is important to bring up in this context of when you just wave your hands and say, I only believe in the things that I can see and I only believe in the things that I can do. And we just don't know what fire is. And we don't know why water doesn't catch on fire, hydrogen does. Well, we do know that. We know the mechanism of that. And so when you admit that you don't know these things, it implies to me that, you know, the kind of basis for just dismissing gravity as a hoax is a little bit shaky. So you're basically just admitting, you're just admitting that water is not H2O. You've just no water is H2O. Words, H2O. <laughs> because it's, so, it's reactivity so with the oxygen. So it's already bonded to the oxygen. And so it's so interacting with oxygen in a different way. If we use electrolysis to separate the components of water, they become highly flammable, if not explosive. Correct. You've just admitted because that. they're no but longer bonded the together. So then what is electrolysis? Electrolysis is your you're removing and actually requires a lot of energy. And and part of the really. uh, problem, <laughs> part of the problem with hydrogen fuel, besides the fact that it's extremely flammable and we don't want to have cars that are kind of like little bombs driving around, even though gasoline is flammable as well. Hydrogen gas, extremely flammable, uh, very dangerous. So it, electrolysis as a means for uh, turning water into a fuel source is problematic, not just because it's dangerous, but because electrolysis requires a great deal of energy to remove that bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen. And so once that bond is broken and you just have hydrogen and oxygen separated from one another molecularly, that is when the hydrogen is allowed to react with oxygen again in a combustion process. But the, the, the molecular binding together in water is what prevents that combustion process. Okay, I just had a lot of word salad there that basically says that water is not its gaseous components of hydrogen and oxygen. It's something well, else. Well, there's no it's elements are not states. Water. This is You've this is it. the problem with your theory is yeah. elements yeah. are not states of matter. So when you say hydrogen is a gas, that's only true under certain conditions of temperature and of pressure. The same oh, so thing. Do you have oxygen. solid hydrogen? Have you got solid hydrogen? You can if you cool hydrogen. And in fact, that is liquid hydrogen is used for fuel in those no, rocket solid, ships that you solid, think are hoaxes. Solid. Do, do you understand the difference between solid, liquid, yeah. and gas? These oh, absolutely. You can get solid hydrogen. It just has to be under you very uh, a low temperature or high pressure. And you can do that? You can just do that in your... I don't backyard. have access to refrigeration that's going to cool down hydrogen to the necessary temperature, and I also don't have no, access... It takes a huge amount of energy in order to create the conditions of which you're talking about. Even though they're theoretically possible... Sure, but in it reality, is possible. where we exist, here in this reality of you know, the, this earth with this temperature where everything exists where it exists, it's not really possible, is it? Yeah, well, we, we can do that. We can. We're talking about everyday observation. 
when it comes to science, we're not talking about theoretical things that we can do due, due to extreme circumstances of something that we've manufactured with great amounts of energy in order to change That's the properties what electrolysis of matter. We're just talking is. about the properties of matter that we can observe, which is basically what gravity boils down to, is that gravity boils down to something that exists in here now at this reality of the things that are observable and repeatable and something that we can do here and now and so you know you're basically shooting yourself in the foot to say that if we go to extreme lengths and apply extreme amounts of energy we can prove a different state of matter of reality but reality just exists as it exists so so why would you even begin to to start with things you know water is not flammable if we use electrolysis that it does invoke applying energy to it. It's not doesn't require a huge amount of energy. You can use a small wattage. Something off your 12 volt battery in a car can create an electrolysis situation where you can separate the hydrogen from the oxygen and then recombine them to create combustion to drive your car. It's pretty basically straightforward. A lot of people do it. If they try and share their information, we get shut down because there are powers that be who don't like us talking about using free energy. Free energy surrounds us. It's all around us. And yet, you know, we're talking about then this energy, which you are talking about, which is the whole point of this debate of a magical, invisible pulling force called gravity. And I'm telling you, it does not exist. I'm just telling you, there is no magical, invisible pulling force of gravity due to attraction of mass. The is, only thing is that magnetism is I'm still speaking. The only thing that exists is resistance. And that resistance is to something of a mass. And that resistant force is an upward force if it has it at all. If it doesn't have it, then the thing falls straight down. This is the whole meat and bones of the argument is that gravity does not exist. It is a fantasy requirement of people who believe we live on a spinning ball that make things stick to the sides and to the underneath of it and to all around the sides. You know, it's not just the sides. It's the whole spherical body of it. And that means that everybody is subject to this force at all times. And it's complete and utter nonsense. It's a requirement of believing in absolute fantasies that are anti-science. They are complete and utter pseudoscience. The only force you have is the observable physical resistance force to something which will fall down unless you can resist it and then it stops. So, you know, we can go and talking about the flammability of gases as, you know, until the cows come home. But the whole point of this is gravity is fake and people who believe in it are brainwashed into believing into absolute fantasies, which are not a part of our reality. Okay, I you're... will say, guys, we got about 10 more minutes until we move into the Q&A. So send in those super chats now. But I want to thank both Iron Horse and Jocko for joining us. And all right, guys, we are talking. Is gravity fake? Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Iron Horse, uh, is magnetism an invisible magical force? Now, magnetism is quite visible and it's quite repeatable. And you can see if you hold a magnet and say you put it under a sheet of paper and you sprinkle some iron filings above it, you can see how it's attracted to it until you reach a certain distance away, which isn't very far, it's only a few centimetres, and the iron magnets will slide off the sheet of paper. So it's not really a force. It is an attractive force within that specific place like if you've got two magnets together you can hold them all day i've spent a lot of time with magnets so i know a little bit about it and you can hold them here nothing here nothing here nothing here boom they clap together and they smash with great force so if you want to talk about a force like magnetism yes it is a very specific force and yes it has a very specific location and as soon as you enter into that magnetic realm of that force then bang it is going to be very, very forceful and you're going to require a lot of force to pull them apart. When we're talking about gravity, uh, yeah, I can waft anything about here, anything about there. I can hit the ground. I can lift it up. There's no force of gravity. It's a myth. Okay. So 
what is the mechanism for magnetism? What is the, what the is the mechanism that produces the force of magnetism? Well, it's obviously some highly electronic uh, atomic attraction of things where the opposites attract one another. You know, nobody really knows the true explanation for the mechanisms of magnetism. You, know, you could ask people till the cows come home. Nobody really knows. But what they do know is that you can see it work. You can see, like, if you put a magnet on the ground and you put one here with the similar poles to each other, this one here will just float. And it will float and float and float if you balance it accurately. It will be an anti-gravity device for all that time. If you switch it around, boom, they click together again. But, you know, the, nobody really knows exactly what that is, but it's obviously to do with the, um, the molecular structure of the ions within the material, because it only applies to certain things which are metallic, such as iron. And when they connect, they connect strongly and they stick. There's no such thing as just orbiting around in perpetual motion like the heliocentric model tells us that the earth does to the sun and the moon does to the earth and the sun does to the great attractor in the middle it's a load of nonsense why is it okay that nobody knows what magnetism is but it's not okay that nobody knows what gravity is well because at least we can observe magnetism and see exactly how it works. But when it comes to gravity, uh, we don't know what it is. But we have to invent then another force, even greater, the dark matter one, which I introduced you to in my opening statement. This invisible force has to be 75% greater than gravity to stop everything from colliding into a singularity. Whereas with magnetism, we don't need that. We can just bring them close enough and bam, they stick together and that's it. Yeah, you know, we don't need to invent invisible forces to stop them from doing that. We just say as soon as they're close enough, bang, it works. That's magnetism. Gravity is a man-made invention which needs something, not even just 75%, in some cases up to 95% to stop the entire universe colliding into a singularity if you believe in the heliocentric model. Yeah, it's just like you keep using these terms like magical and invisible. And I mean, couldn't we apply the same thing to magnetism, I guess, is the question. But maybe we'll move beyond that. Um, so you divide everything into... Well, we could. Or... We could. Yeah, no, we could. But, but, but we, we, know that it's, we know that it's visible we, because we can see it. You know, that's the difference in science. We, we record what we can see. We don't believe in things we can't see. So with magnetism, we can see it. We can see the results and effects of it. With gravity, we can't. We invent other invisible forces that we can't see as well to, to make that thing. So How do you... You, know, you can't just move past that. You can't just brush over that. You, you have to admit that the visible things are science. The invisible you... things are pseudoscience. How do you explain uh, the coincidence of the tides following the movements of the moon? Oh, very easily. Please go ahead. Oh, you'd like me to elaborate? Okay. Say, yes, say you've got a straw. You've got a straw, right? And you've got a glass of water. And, and you hold the straw just above the glass of water and you suck as hard as you can. That water does not move whatsoever. And that proves that you cannot pull water. Now, you do the same thing, but you blow on that water. That water can easily be repelled. And so, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I, I don't have a lot of consensus with this. I'm on my own as far as the flat earth cosmology goes with this. But my attitude towards what the moon is, it's an artificial construct here on Earth. And the force that holds it aloft and it goes around 50 minutes slower per day than the sun, that very force is a diamagnetic force. And the diamagnetic force is repulsive. And so what it's basically doing from way up high, like at least 70 miles, is 
diametrically pushing or diamagnetically, sorry, pushing against the oceans and spreading them out on its daily path as it goes around us. And of course, when it reaches a, a continent, it's pushed the water as far as it can, and then it continues on its path. That water then flows back, and that creates the secondary high tide. So we've got a, a, a repellent force is what's re creating the tides. The globe itself says it's gravity. It says that this moon is just pulling the oceans. As I just showed you with the straw, you cannot pull water. You can easily repel it, but you cannot pull, uh, push it. Um, you cannot pull it. You, you can. It's easy to repel. So the, the splashback effect then will create the secondary high tide on the globe with one moon, with one mass going around approximately every 25 hours, you will just have one massive high tide on the side of the moon and a massive low tide on the backside. But we've got two high and two low tides every day on the flat stationary planet Earth. And that is because the moon is having this very gentle effect. It only moves the massive trillions and billions of mega litres air approximately one to two metres. And it will have delayed effects in other places according to the geographical things. But the tides can only be explained by something repelling the water ahead of it, which I've personally witnessed multiple times. So you said that the straw experiment proves that water cannot be pulled what if I take a straw and I start sucking above a magnet and the magnet is not pulled? Does that prove magnets can't be pulled? Well, for one thing, I don't think magnets are a fluid or liquid to start with. We're talking about the liquid oceans. So, um, so you're saying uh, oh. there's no such thing as a liquid magnet? Oh, I'm sure you can have something that resembles a liquid but yeah probably not no like mercury is probably the only liquid metal that we know about and i don't think it can be magnetized prove me wrong right so when you're when you're saying that things can't be sucked i mean obviously when you suck on a straw you're you're sucking in the air and so the air is being pulled up through the straw. If instead there was liquid in that straw, the liquid be, be pulled up through the straw. If there was a mixture of, you know, water and sand, you'd be pulling a mixture of that. So the idea of, of an upward force being applied, the idea that the moon is somehow a big straw. I mean, what, what, what do you think the shape of the, do you think the moon is a sphere or a ball or do you think it's flat? What kind of, shape does it have well What's okay you're jumping all around the place here and you know i think we'll, we'll go back to your your and first I thing first we'll we say iron after you answer that question i think it'll be a good time for us to naturally move into some fun q a and we'll get some new ideas from our audience no worries amy um yeah, basically, we started with the whole idea of a, a straw sucking. And the straw sucking is, I think, the perfect example of how gravity is such a weak force, it's non-existent. Because you can just use a little suction on a straw and that water or soda, whatever you've got in your straw, is going to become anti-gravity. You're just, and it's going straight into you. You need very little force whatsoever to overcome the force of gravity, as we believe, that something uh, 238,000 miles away is pulling trillions and trillions of tons of ocean around. Um, a, a simple straw, that's just the, the simplest form of a siphon, because inside of you, you have a water level and you've got a vacuum force. Yeah, you know, with a vacuum force, we exist under air pressure. So if you use a vacuum, say, to siphon some water out of a fish tank, you can send that tube. Yeah, you know, it can only be a tiny little tube. It only has to be 12 millimetres. I used to use a 40 millimetre one to get it done really fast. But you can run a tube and you can run it up several stories of height. And so long as the bottom end of that is lower, 
than your initial source of where the water was, that water itself is creating a vacuum inside that tube, and that is the siphon effect. And that siphon is so anti-gravity, apparently somebody's done it up to as much as 13 stories high. I don't know what that is in metres or feet or whatever, but it's pretty bloody high. That is an anti-gravity device of water going against the force of gravity, if that's such a thing, as much as it wants to, simply because it is seeking its own level. So to think that the moon, which has no tube, has no straw, it has nothing except a lot of empty space, hundreds of thousands of miles away, is somehow pulling water against Earth's own gravity, which is apparently what's holding the moon in place in the first place, then you've, you've really got nothing. <laughs> you've got nothing. Gravity is the most fakest thing ever. A vacuum force is extremely strong, which you can see with just the tiniest little vacuum tube as much as a little straw. And sorry, gravity is fake. Our discussion is over. Let's go to the questions and answers. And all right, we'll give you a chance to have closing statements at the very end, but we are moving into about 40 minutes of Q&A. This is a chance for you to send your questions to either or both of our interlocutors, Iron, Whore, Iron and Jockel. Also, Super Chats are turned on, and they will move your questions to the front of the line. So remember, folks, don't forget to like and subscribe. And with that, let the fun begin from a $5 Super Chat from Jim Bob. Deep left, where in Cavendish is gravity isolated as an independent variable? Cavendish, where okay. is Cavendish? Yeah, so we've got two parts to the Cavendish experiment. You have the the physical, um, you know, setup where you have like a, a pole, a ruler, something suspended from a string, and then you've got these two weights on either end. Um, so we're we're measuring kind of over time the oscillation of the, this system you know it's kind of moving back and forth randomly and then you place in uh you, you place in a weight like a concrete block or a bowling ball next to those that system and you can see how the system stops oscillating randomly and it's clearly attracted to that mass and so it's the acceleration of that system that is the output that's the the dependent variable and the independent is the system itself the setup that you have thank you so much and five dollars super chat from joshua larson nibba talmot them vibrations nibba talmot them vibrations not sh yeah that went over my head couldn't quite hear it yeah something about vibrations if you would like to resend that joshua and we're not getting something here feel free to tag me in chat at amy newman if not we thank you for the support joshua five dollar super chat from mr monster the great oceanic currents including the Antarctic Ocean current, proves that Earth is a globe. You cannot have ocean currents on a flat plane. Well, that's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Of course, you can have ocean currents because on the flat plane, you know, we're not talking about a tiny little model as the globers like to believe everything. You know, they, they live for their little classroom models and everything just revolves around at the tilt of 66.6 .6 degrees and it all works out all peachy clean and shit no in reality the earth is massive we've got something i would think at least eighty thousand mile circumference where the antarctic ice wall is and the equator being about twenty five thousand miles that is the place where the sun goes around us every day and of course it gets higher and lower to give us the seasons but Basically, all the heat 
comes from the light into the oceans. And of course, that's going to create oceanic currents because heat rises and cold air sinks. That That is just a basic given of anything in physics is that heat rises, cold air sinks. And so what happens when something rises is something has to move in to fill its place. And that is what creates currents because the sun is going around us. That is going to create the pattern of our currents. It's very, very straightforward. $5 super chat from Jim Bob. Deep love. What are the properties of space time such that it can be bent? The term bent is, you know, basically a metaphor, you know, that I think uh, Effie mentioned earlier, three dimensions, X, Y, Z, uh, spatially, but then we also have dimensions of time and we have dimensions of energy, uh, you know, in, in a model or a system, you could think of color as a dimension, you know, on a color spectrum. So, you know, anything can be a dimension. And then as we measure reality, we measure different forces in reality, directionality. Um, and we say that something is bent. Well, it's kind of a model. Everyone's probably seen the bowling ball model where it's like you have a, a bed, you put a bowling ball on it, and then things kind of roll toward uh, the, the lowest point. Uh, that's basically a mathematical model and a metaphor that helps us understand um, how gravity can be modeled that doesn't really, again, in the immediate kind of naive empiricism that uh, flat earth would want, uh, you're not, you're not going to see that type of bending. Although, you know, we, we do, you know, look at black holes and we see, light bending in that way, but that's not really the same thing that we mean when we say space time is bent by gravity. I think the word bent here as a, you know, a physical term that we use every, like you bend, you know, a piece of metal, it's not really what's mean meant. We should really just say affected, right? And, and you have a certain model, just like we have an atomic model where we have a nucleus and then we have an electron cloud. Everyone's seen like the spinning electrons in the nucleus, does an atom actually look like that? No, an atom is mostly empty space, but we have these pictures and models that are used to explain uh, through imagery phenomena that are happening. Thank you, and a $5 super chat from GJMPTW. Occupants of the zero G plane become weightless when the plane takes a dive. The cabin is sealed and the air density remains constant. Explain, Flurfs. That is absolutely 100% wrong, wrong, wrong. They did not become weightless. They are simply just dropping due to their mass in the medium of air at the same speed as the surroundings surrounding them which is the plane everything of a mass drops at the same speed it will take air resistance through the medium of air so they're not weightless but how do you determine weight what you need to determine weight is a scale and how does a scale work a scale only works because it is placed on the non-moving ground you have to have that resistant force from beneath in the first place in order to determine a weight. So if everything is dropping at the same time, including the scale, it will appear weightless, but that doesn't mean that it is weightless. To think that it is weightless, that's a mental uh, deficiency in the person who believes in such a thing. Your mass has remained the same the entire time. And so to call it anti-gravity, simply because you've lost the ability to measure the weight, that is also a mental deficiency of somebody who really doesn't have a good grasp on reality. $5 super chat from Oflamo. Iron Horse, why can you see the sun from your house and I can't? A planet is in my line of sight, the one we're sitting on the edge of. Um, well, that's a bit of a trick question there. I think the reason you can't see it from my house is because you're not here at my house. 
you know, I can say it for my ass because I am at my house, but the reason you can't, um, I, I, I hope you can ask me that second part of that question again because I obviously paid five bucks. Sure, and it, it might have been, I'm not 100% if there was supposed to be a period here or it wasn't, but there is, so I'll say it like it's written. A planet is in my line of sight, the one we are sitting on the edge of. Yeah, no, I've got nothing there. I think he might be talking about the horizon, which doesn't prove anything other than perspective and distance and the laws of convergence. But if he's talking about looking at another planet, obviously you can only see them at night. Um, they're still just wandering stars. They don't prove anything about the ground beneath us. So, yeah, I think we can move on. Mm -hmm. Uh a super question, I think, from membership, which you can become a membership here on Modern Day Debate. From Sunflower, Jockle, is truth more important than happiness? That's an interesting question. I mean, I could go on for an hour about the nature of happiness. I mean, happiness, uh, probably the most simple definition is when we feel good, the truth doesn't always make us feel good in the moment. Um, but, you know, if we assume, and it's probably a big assumption, we'd have to go into Schopenhauer and, and you know, all sorts of uh, religious pessimism to uh, criticize this. But if we just assume that uh, happiness, to feel any happiness at all, we have to be alive. And to be alive, we have to align ourselves at some point uh, with truth, that if we stray too far with the truth, uh, we're out of sync with reality, we're going to, uh, we're going to die, uh, then ultimately happiness relies upon truth. However, um, you know, truth doesn't necessarily rely on whether something makes you happy or not, at least not in the moment. Mm -hmm. And all right, $5 super chat from Mr. Monster. In a vacuum with no air, a feather and a bowling ball will fall at the same rate because gravity is acting upon them with the same force. No, no. What's, what's reacting upon them is non-reaction. There is no reaction. So in a vacuum, you've got no resistance. In air, you've got a little bit of resistance. Most things appear to drop at the same rate, but obviously a balloon won't drop at the same rate as a, you know, a brick. But you put them into a vacuum, assuming the balloon is just full of air. Um, well, first of all, the balloon will expand and pop because air cannot exist in a vacuum. Air just doesn't exist in a vacuum. You, you will not be able to have it. So let's say we have an empty balloon and a brick. And in a vacuum, you can drop them and they will fall at the same rate because you've got zero resistance until the place of resistance which is the floor of the of the vacuum chamber you, you can't have a vacuum without a chamber and to have that chamber you need seriously strong solid sides massive pumps to pump the air out massive seals and a whole heap of complicated things to allow a vacuum state to exist which is not just a natural state wafting around the outside of the air but let's use another example and let's say we have a, a empty balloon and a brick and we put some helium inside the balloon. We have added mass to the balloon. Let's forget the vacuum chamber for a second. Yeah, we're just in the outside environment. You can still drop the empty balloon and the brick and they'll fall at the same rate. Let's just go out into our normal atmosphere because creating a vacuum chamber, you can only... You can't breathe in there. You know, all your blood and your liquids will boil at room temperature. You won't survive for more than a couple of seconds. You'll pass out pretty much instantly. So we're just in our normal environment. We've got the balloon, the brick. They drop. Now let's fill the balloon with more mass, but this mass is helium, and we tie a knot in it. We seal it off. And now this balloon has more mass than it had to begin with, and you've got your brick. Now the, the balloon should just sort of drop slightly less faster than the brick but no the balloon whew, it shoots up why relative density 
to the environment with the, within which it's in. The, the atmosphere, it is a lot less dense now and the brick still drops at exactly the same rate. So it's all relative density relative to the medium with it, with, within which it's in. $10 super chat from Robert Liscum. Iron Horse, just because you don't understand something doesn't make it false. Professional scientists who do this for a living, I've worked out all the details for you. Okay. Well, I actually came across a very interesting meme just recently you know i know we don't live by memes or whatever but the best one was and we're specifically told that a scientist follows the money he's not going to go out and do an experiment for the hell of it to get his name into a book he's going to go out and do an experiment where the money is and so this meme showed a scientist with a you know an eyepiece to a wad of money and that is what scientists scientists is all about they're following the money. They don't give a damn about the truth. They just want to get a paycheck at the end of the day. And so they can all go and take a flying up the wherever it goes because they are a bunch of liars. They're following the money. They're sellouts. There's no such thing as a true scientist today until you look at somebody like a flat earther. We are the true scientists of today. Thank you, and thank you so very much, Robert. But a $5 super chat from Majorlin? Majorlin? IH, it's the case that you presuppose, Iron Horse, it's the case that you presuppose Flat Earth, and anything contrary to that you reinvent. If 2 plus 2 equaled 4 show the Earth is round, you would say it would equal five. Yeah, but two plus two doesn't equal four when you start to use perspective. And this is a very interesting part of perspective because if I look out into the distance, right, say I'm looking across into the distance, say that's my horizon there because that's where my eyes are. This part here could be three. This part here could be two. This part here could be one. And this part here could be, you know, less and less and less. And the more you're looking into the distance, all of a sudden you are looking into this tiny little infinite space, which might be 500. But this part down here, which was one, seems to be much bigger than the part that's 500. You cannot use pers uh, perspective and mathematics, you know, the two plus two equals four, because two plus two doesn't always equal four. If you're talking about perspective, perspective means things get smaller in the distance. You're seeing a, a lot more distance in this amount of space than you're seeing in this amount of space as opposed to this amount of space. So anybody who thinks that you can use simple, simple geometry, simple mathematics to explain the nature of reality as we see it, well, they're just insane. They, they haven't really gone outside and experimented and seen the world as we see it. Five dollar super chat from Cole Beasley. Give me your dealer's number. You got some good stuff. I need that stuff, bro. There's my dealer. We're making connections Good tonight. Very. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Cole. And a two dollar. Super chat from Mr. Monster. How does the Coriolis effect work on the flat Earth? Well, basically, the Coriolis effect doesn't work. It doesn't do any work. What the Coriolis effect only applies to is our weather patterns. Weather patterns spiral clockwise one direction uh, in one part of the hemisphere. I can't even remember off the top of my head now, one side of the equator and anti-clockwise the other side of the equator. I think it's clockwise south of the equator. Either way, it's because the sun goes around the equator daily and the heat of that sun creates an effect where the light draws heat up and therefore moisture and that is what creates our weather. 
we have weather here on the flat earth. Believe it or not, yeah, flat earth actually has weather. And these things are going in opposite directions because one is a high pressure system, one is a low pressure system. And the low pressure system basically draws more moisture up. It's as simple as, you know, if you go up to a, a mountain, water will boil at a lower temperature than it does lower down. And so when you've got low pressure, the water moisture builds up much faster. And because the sun goes a particular direction, which is clockwise, if you're looking down upon the planet Earth, the, the weather systems will follow that pattern. And it's a little bit like the butterfly effect. Once the thing is in motion, it's the same as water going down a drain. Once you start the water going a particular direction, it'll keep going down that direction, down the drain. It doesn't matter which hemisphere you're in. You can do the same with the water and start at the other direction and it will continue going in that direction. That is fluid dynamics. And the weather follows fluid dynamics. There's nothing else affecting it except for the sun itself. And so the sun, as it goes around daily, that is what creates the weather systems going opposite directions. There's no other Coriolis effect apart from what we see in the weather systems, which is what our tropical storms, tropical cyclones, um, I think you call them hurricanes or something on the northern side, that is what affects them. And if for some reason one of them happens to wander across that equatorial belt, the next day as the sun comes around, it will quickly diminish it because all the heat is going the opposite way and as soon as these things hit land mass bam well they, they stop sucking moisture up it's all about the moisture and water that's what creates the, a tropical cyclone for anybody who's a real meteorologist you'll know that as soon as a, a cyclone hits land mass it stops its power it loses it because it's no longer drawing moisture up out of the warmed up ocean through a low pressure system to create a massive weather storm. The rain dissipates, it slowly stops. It's, that's the Coriolis effect. There's nothing else to Coriolis apart from that. If there was, you could just send a hot air balloon up into the air for one hour and it would land a thousand miles to the west. But that never happens. Thank you so very much. And $2 super chat well, again from Mr. Monster. How do ocean currents work on the flat Earth? Same sort of deal. It's just the the, the differentiation, you yeah? know, hot air rises, hot water rises. Everything rises, and as it rises, it displaces that which is beneath it, and cold air has to, or cold water moves in to replace it. And so it does the same thing with the ocean currents as it does with the air currents. No different. Five dollar super chat from Blind Mason. Jocko, what does deep left mean? Does it have something to do with the depth of the Earth disk? I think it does now. I think after this debate, I'm going to have to add that to the uh, list of meanings of deep left. But uh, it's basically, you know, again, I, I had mentioned earlier this question I had of why is so much art left wing versus right wing? Um, I also had this question of why is it that uh, the left continues to win basically every, you know, from the origin of the term left wing in the French Revolution, even before in the English Revolution, why does the left wing always win versus the right? And uh, I think that requires a uh, class analysis of... Uh, what I call the, the tripartite system of warrior, priest, and merchant. So that's the intro to the deep left. You can learn more about that on my channel. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much, Jockle. And the question from Blind Mason. But $5 super chat from Brad Wagner to Ross Iron. How much helium did the giants pump in the, to the moon? to make it float? Uh, sufficient. There we go. Thank you so very much, Brad. And another $5 super chat from Ron Boyd. Flat Earth Aussie Iron. What's your explanation for an observably spherical moon 
with craters on all parts of its surface and nothing falling off the bottom. Uh, well, I'd suggest that um, if something did land on the bottom, it would fall off. So, of course, it appears like a sphere because we can see the shadows and we can see the craters, which I believe are actually bubbles burst into the molten surface as it was created and as it rose up and rapidly cooled. And so a lot of those bubbles set in place, as we see. So um, if anything was to actually land on the moon, um, even a speck of dust or a moth or a moon lander, it would just drop straight back down to Earth due to the laws of density and buoyancy. And a final super chat before we move into some questions from the audience. So if you want your burning desire question pushed right to the front, now is the time to send in your super chats. But Decepticons Forever, $5 super chats. Thank you so much. Ask, just want to reiterate in Aussie is basking in the sunlight telling North Americans the earth is flat as a bedtime story on live stream. <laughs> yeah, well, this is exactly how the flat earth model works. You know, we, we see the earth as a, a really, really, really big, you know, if you want to think of it as a space pizza, you know, go ahead and think of it as that. We don't think it's in space. We think it's the only physical plane at the bottom of the earth, but it is more or less divided up as a pizza. And you can think of that pizza as a clock face. And right in the middle of that clock face is where the hour hand extends out from it. And on that hour hand is the sun. And the sun goes around the equatorial belt once every 24 hours. And so everywhere where it's particularly above, which is, it was a couple of hours ago here now, it's, it's almost three o'clock here now. But everywhere where the sun is particularly above, that is your local 12 midday. And that is why we have time zones on the planar Earth. It's basically spread out. You know, I, I could share an um, uh, image or a meme, whatever, to show exactly how that works. But basically, that hour hand is the clock. And that is why we get 24 hours in every single day. It just goes around, the, around Polaris around the equatorial belt and wherever it's directly above is their current 12 midday and as it moves 15 degrees per hour eventually after 24 of them it's done 360 degrees and so the flat earth model makes far more sense and i'm going to go into this just a tiny little bit more into depth because if we were on a spinning ball in outer space hurtling around the sun then if we're using a physical, measurable, mechanical clock that only measures 24 hours per day, that is a fixed amount of time, then we would have to adjust that clock because every day we're going around the sun, you know, instead of the sun going around above us, then that clock, that, that, that our Earth is going to be out by about a degree every single day. And so if you don't adjust the clock by about four minutes per day, which is one degree, then eventually, in six months' time, when you're on the other side of the sun, then your 12 midday, according to a fixed clock, is looking directly away from the sun in the middle of the night. So midnight and midday has swapped places. And that is a mathematical and logical fact that disproves the heliocentric model 100%. It can only work because the sun is rotating above, around above us at exactly 24 hours per day. Thanks for the question. Thank you so much for the super chat, Decepticons Forever. And with that, we are going to move into some normal questions like Stone Zebra 666 asks, shoot a bullet straight, it falls, right? When you hit a target from a long distance, you have to calculate for bullet drop, right? Gravity proven. Yeah, that's just basically resistance. Everything has resistance, and that resistance is the medium of air. There's no such thing as the Coriolis effect. There's no such thing as gravity. 
It's just resistance in the medium. And if you're going to shoot far enough away, you have to take that into account that that bullet or ball or whatever you're shooting is going to drop a certain amount over that period of time due to the resistance of air. Question from Brassman. Why towards the ground, though? Air would be less dense upward, so shouldn't the hammer go up instead because that's where the least resistance? That's where there's the least resistance. Because, oh God, it's the relationship or relative density of one thing to another. And so if you want to get lifted up, you need something of more resistance to push you up. Something of less resistance is not going to allow you to go up. It's going to allow you to drop. So the least resistant place is going to take you through the path of least resistance to the place of most resistance. Something less resistant higher up is not going to give you that lifting force that you expect you would get for reasons, I don't know, because something more dense falls through the thing of less density, not gets lifted up by the thing of less density. Ugh. Question from Bo Smith. Then what causes the dropping? Why wouldn't it float or something else? Lack of resistance. Question from John Edwards. Is the sun flat? Probably not. Question from Extra J. Iron Horse. Yeah, gravity pulls air towards the surface. How is this confusing for you? No, it doesn't. Gravity doesn't pull air to the surface at all. You can go up for miles and miles and miles and still be in air. How can you say it's pulling at the surface? It's pulling at the surface. I'd have to get down on my hands and knees in order to be able to breathe. What a ridiculous concept. Air molecules have no attraction of mass to, to the mass of the Earth whatsoever. They waft up as far and as, as much as they want. That's why we have winds. That's the most ridiculous concept I've ever heard to say that air is attracted to the earth because of gravity. That's the most crazy, crazy, crazy notion I've ever heard. You only get to a certain point because there's less of it and you can't breathe so much. But yeah, if it was attracted to earth, we'd have to get down our hands and knees and suck off off the ground just to be able to breathe. Stupid. Question from Puttyfoot. If gravity is fake, why does the Cavendish experiment work? It doesn't work. What, what, what do you mean by work? Work means a, an application of energy. If you're applying energy, then as soon as you release those balls in, in the dangling you know, apparatus that you use in the, the caveman dish experiment, those balls should instantly go towards those other balls but no sometimes you know there's a lot of scientists who who hate the cavendish experiment who are trying to teach it in college they hate it because it doesn't always work it takes a lot of work to make it work and more often than not it doesn't you know every now and then you're going to get this attraction of something in motion it's just going to come to rest against something that's more solid than it, and oh, phew, we've just proved gravity. No, it's just it's just basic laws of motion. That's all you're seeing. You know, to 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 think that that's an attraction of mass, you got no brains up here to think that that caveman dish experiment proves attraction of mass. Five dollar super chat from Ozine, moving right to the front of the line. Is buoyancy an attractive or repellent? force buoyancy is basically um it is repellent but <laughs> the the word 
the specific word is it for it is resistance. It's a resistant force. It's resistant due to the relative density of the medium. So buoyancy is generally applied to something in a liquid. And so in a liquid, say it'd be water, which is our general one, you know, you're more buoyant in salt water because salt water is more dense than fresh water. So it's a, a buoyancy effect is due to the resistance due to relative density. Yeah, you know, if you try to suspend a, a an iron anvil in a medium of purified water, boom, straight to the bottom. You put in salt water, slowly sinks down a little bit slower. Anyway, you put it into a medium of mercury, which is a liquid metal, and it floats. It's all about relative density. It's got nothing to do with some invisible pulling force due to the mass of the Earth. Yeah, you know, it's. That's the most unscientific thinking ever to think that the mass of the earth is the reason why things fall down. It's the relative density of the medium that's in. Question from Guy Tory. What's the other side of a flat earth look like? The same as this side. Yeah, you know, I mean, what do you what do you call a side, you know? To, to assume that there's a, an underside of something, well, yeah, that's something you have to prove in the first place. When we think of the other side, I think, well, the other side of the equator. It, it appears different. We can see different stars because we've travelled further. Yeah, the other side, you know, it's a nonsensical question because you assume that we live on a spinning ball in the first place. Well, what's on the other side of the spinning ball? More space. What's on the underside of a physical plane? Well, we can only go down as far as eight miles. That's the maximum we've ever been able to drill down through. That was the Russians at this, um, some, yeah, I, I don't remember every little trivial detail, but they can go down almost eight miles and they reach a position at that depth. We cannot go any further. And that's eight miles. You know, that's not even a scratch on the surface of the, the crust of this spherical ball that we believe in. So when we say we're on a flat planar Earth, as far as we're concerned, this is the only physical plane at the bottom of the known universe. What's beneath us, I think we're better off not finding out. Thank you so very much. And Ozine asks another $5 super chat. Resistance is not a force. It slows down or it stops the effects of a force. Of course resistance is the force. Resistance is the only force. That's the only force at all. You know, you know just ask Newton. Newton said that a thing in motion stays in motion unless another force reacts against it. So if something's in motion, it'll just stay in motion unless you've got resistance. Resistance is that force that stops it. And it's like pretty simple. I mean, if, if you jumped off a building, you, you could continuously fall for, for, for per, perpetuity through the infinite vacuum of space. But you're going to meet the force of resistance when you hit physical solid matter, and that might do you some damage. So I recommend you don't do that because the resistant force is very forceful, and that is the force, resistance. The force is resistance. May the force be with you. I guess in this moment of si uh, silence, I'll just chime in that uh, is magnetism resistance? You said all resistance is force, all force is resistance. Is magnetism resistance? Magnetism is attraction. That, 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 that is different because it's magnetism. And magnetism is an electrical coherent force of things that attract to one another. It's... um. 
it'll still suffer the same effects of resistance. Like if you put something between you, you know, that'll still resist the magnets from attracting to one another. That's why we use them in a fish tank to clean the glass <laughs> because there's sufficient resistance between them to to rub them around to to clean the glass and that force of attraction, which is magnetism. But magnetism is not something that I see in everyday life with every other thing I do. Every magnetic or metallic thing was somehow attracted to the earth. Like we wouldn't be able to drive our car, you know, all the metal would just go bang, smack the earth. We can't move. You know, magnetism and attraction of due to mass, completely different things. $2 super chat from Y Kickamoo Cow8055. <laughs> Ross, how did giants build the moon? Uh, I would suggest that they probably smelted the raw materials from some sort of great source, uh, something that, you know, as a suggestion, might look a little bit like the Grand Canyon. I, I don't know. But that's just the first thing that came to mind where you're going to uh, attain such a great mass of materials. And I'd say they, they must have used some sort of great furnace to smelt those raw materials, which, oh, I don't know, something like Yellowstone National Park. That might be a, a sufficient sort of smelting point to, you know, smelt them. Yeah, I don't know. All I'm suggesting is that I have my own uh, proposal for how the moon came into existence, and I haven't seen a better one come from mainstream scientists. So I just put my proposal out there to see if it can be debunked. And yeah, if it can be debunked with a better proposal for why all the craters just look like bubbles burst on the surface and so forth, yeah, I'm happy to hear it. But to this day, all I've heard is only people attack me as a person for proposing it as opposed to attacking the actual argument. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I think it was smelted. It was made here on Earth by some mad mind genius, somebody who was trying to, say, impersonate the sun and possibly even give us, you know, a perpetual sunlight through the night so that we don't have to suffer darkness. Yeah, you know, they may, may have had good intentions. Yeah, you know, who, who would know? But, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, it was made here on Earth by somebody with some intelligent sort of intention for whatever purposes. And thank you so very much, Why Kick a Moo Cow, but a $10 super chat from Ozen. Electrical current is determined by the amount of force called voltage divided by the amount of resistance. In buoyancy, what is the resistance and what is the force? Well, it's certainly not a uh, copper wire to start with. You know, electrical force has the resistance due to the, the medium through which it's propagating through. So, you know, you, you can't really compare one and the same. We know the resistance force of air, which is next to nothing. We drop something, it breaks. Oh, bugger. But, you know, if we send a charge through an electrical wire, well, the bigger the wire or well, the bigger the conductivity of it, well, the greater the charge we can send through it. I, I just don't see how there's any comparison from the two. Unless you can just ask that question one more time because I might have missed exactly what he was getting at. Absolutely. A $10 super chat from Ozen. Thank you so much for the support. An electrical current is determined by the amount of force called voltage divided by the amount of resistance. In buoyancy, what is the resistance and what is the force? Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, the resistance is basically the relative density of the medium as opposed to the mass. You know, the mass or the weight, the gravis, the, the, the weight of the object has resistance as opposed to the medium. And that's a very interesting thing too, which 
I'll just briefly touch upon, since there doesn't seem to be a lot of questions coming through, is that you can take an iron ball, you know, an iron ball, and it will drop through the medium of water rather rapidly. You know, it will hit at the same speed as a rubber ball dropped from a bridge because that's through the medium of air. But in the medium of water, because it has a greater density, it will continue to drop while the rubber ball floats. But if you took that same iron ball and you beat it flat and smashed it into shape and built it into a ship, then that ship is now containing a lot of air and it will float. So it has now got buoyancy because it's containing air. Now, if you replace that air with the medium of water, it will sink again. So this is a, the whole point of relative density and buoyancy is how much it can, can contain from the beneathness of something. You know, I don't know if there's a better word for it. You know, from whatever, everything finds its level, you know, its volume. You, know, you turn the volume of music down. You turn the volume of music up. Does that mean it's going up? Or the music is going down? And no, it's just the volume. And so the volume of air in a particular medium or the volume of water in a particular medium determines up and down its density and buoyancy, or as we call it, the energy of frequency and vibration, as Tesla told us. Question from C4. I wonder what it would look like if you plotted the subsolar points of many people going from the U.S. to China and the U.S. to the tip of South America. Huh, what would that show? I think that's a great question. And, and I would like to see the same sort of thing. But what I'd also like to see you know, at the same time is if, let's say, for example, you know, we weren't exactly in the biggest frozen lake in the world, Lake Bacal in Russia. Uh, say we're just down there, a, a normal frozen lake. And it's a big lake. And we're looking up through the lake and we're seeing the sun through the ice and we see a hot, hot, hot spot apparition of the sun and we think, oh, that's the sun. And then we've got another fish, you know, like 500 meters away and he's looking up through that same ice to a completely different part of the ice and he looks up and goes, ooh, that's our sun. That's our hot spot apparition of the sun. And that is the sun. Now, we're basically doing the same thing on a planetary scale, for want of a better word. We're doing the same thing by looking up at something through something we don't even know what it is we're looking up at it through the firmament and so when we see a hot spot apparition you know if, if we're to do that somewhere on the same latitude which is the same distance from polaris and then we go a different distance from polaris this we're going to see a different angle of shadows and whatnot but we're not going to see where the sun itself is which is way above this layer of ice through which we're looking at looking through it and thinking that that is the sun. You know, it's as silly as the fish thinking that they're able to determine the distance of the sun through looking at it through a layer, which gives them a personal apparition of what they're looking at. And all right, guys, we're going to do a few more questions and then we're going to wrap it up for the night with closing statements. But I want to send a lot of love to I. To both of our interlocutors with us tonight, both Iron and Jockel, as we have been looking at, is gravity fake? And question from Aaron Reese, but why does a more dense item go down and not up? It has a 50% chance of going either direction. The very concept of thinking that something less dense is going to give you more resistance than something more dense is insanity. Please stop asking that same question. You go to the place of the most resistance, which is the ground. Question from S. Aston. Explain why rain falls. 
because it's more dense than air. It's, it's quite simple, you know. When water um, coagulates or coalesces or condenses into moisture again, you know, it's gone from the gaseous state due to density you know, and temperature and it um, condenses into something of a mass, then, of course, it becomes more dense than the air surrounding it, so it falls. Very, very simple. Five dollar super chat from Ozen. Work is the force divided by the resistance to that force. Mass and relative density is the resistance. What force is moving it up and down? Well, again, it's just relative density. You know, if you're more dense. Thank you so very much, Ozen. $2 super chat from Mr. Monster. What are stars made of according to Flat Earth? Relative density to its surroundings. What was that? The answer to the forces moving up and down or to what stars are made of? They... There was that up and down. Okay, had a second of lag at the very end uh, for what force is moving <laughs> up and down. Then $2 super chat from Mr. Monster. What are stars made of according to Flat Earth? Well, nobody knows what stars are made of because they're in a, a realm above us. You know, we, we could conjecture, you know, use conjecture to to consider perhaps they are sonar luminescence and sonar luminescence means uh, a sound or vibratory frequency, which is, again is what Nikola Tesla told us is that everything in the universe in order to understand it is vibration and frequency and energy and so, you know, you might even say, if you're that way inclined, to say, well, it's the uh, choir of the angels. You know, if the angels are singing, you know, maybe they exist on a completely different vibratory frequency from us. So what we think of singing, yeah, we, we might see sometimes uh, a great singer might break a glass, but these things, these higher aspects of where we've come from, uh, are able to vibrate at such a high frequency that they can create this sonar luminescence, which is why the stars sparkle and create this frequency of light into our realm. Like, I'm not saying that is the reason, but that is what I can consider one of the greater understandings of why we see them. It is literally the choir of the angels, each one singing at their own frequency. We got three questions left. Steve Frenzy, water can take on memory. And, oh, these are two different people. Steve Frenzy asks, water can take on memory? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, because water takes on vibrancy and uh, vibration and frequency. And so as soon as you imbue it with a certain frequency, you will remember that. You know, it's just that, that is why we have memory. You know, if, if we dehydrated our brain, for example, we would have no memory. We'd be dead. But because we have water and fluids and so forth flowing through us, we can take on memories. And so the memory is contained within water itself. And you can imbue that. You, you can give it positive energy or you can give it negative energy. But water absolutely is the frequency of memory if we lost all our water on the earth you know for one thing there'd be nobody left to live and there'd be no memory so we've lost it all so it's just wiped clean slate just like the surface of the moon so water is absolutely the key to our understanding of vibrant vi Sorry, my neighbor's got his lawnmower going. Um, we've got vib vibration and frequency according to 
the molecular structure of the water of which we are made of, which is our very being. Woohoo! Thank you so very much. Colorado Biker asked the same thing about memory, so we'll put those together and go. John Rapp asks, he says, good day, girl. What is up? A question for both. A one kilogram weight on a scale registers one kilogram. Push on that scale with your hand until it reads one kilogram. You are applying a force. What is the weight applying? Yeah, if this is for both, it's applying a force. Uh, force of the mass with the force. Uh, mass of the earth, mass of the object creates a force, downward force, attracting them together. Your hand pushing creates a force. There you go. Okay, well, my answer will be is that um, your hand is applying a force because your, your hand has mass and you're applying energy. If you wish to say that, but you can stop applying an amount of energy. Like if you kept on pressing, it would measure more than one kilogram. So mass itself has weight and so weight itself is the force and that is what gravity literally translates as is weight so the only force of attraction is weight and that only has way a weight by putting the scale on the side of a wall or on the ceiling you have to put it beneath it because it's always a downward direction so the reason why we can measure weight is because it is a downward force and it is its own force. It is not due to the attraction of mass because if it was, then a larger mass would be more attractive towards the Earth faster than a smaller mass. And yet we know for a fact that all masses drop in the same rate in the medium of air with the same amount of resistance at exactly the same rate. So it is not attractive force, it is simply the way things the nature of reality and all right the last question of the night and send in love to all of you who sent your questions in but a five dollar super chat from free life taz asks how do flurfs explain moon phases well as flurfs we play moon phases but it's a simple fact, you know, if, if we've got a 24 hour clock as we consider the sun to be rotating around us to give us our 24 different time zones, well, the moon is doing something similar and it's a little bit slower and it takes 50 minutes per day slower to go around us. And they're both basically in exactly the same time and space as we can see them from our point of view. They're almost identical. And so, when we see a full moon, that is always going to rise. We saw it just two nights ago for these people who are naturally aware and know where they live and aware of their surroundings. The full moon rose about two nights ago. And when it rose, it was exactly at sunset. And why? It's because the sun and moon are diametrically opposite one another. And then the next night, last night, the moon rose 50 minutes later because it it's delayed by that much. So we see what appears to be almost a full moon. It's 50 minutes below. And 50 minutes is quite a big amount of time. So by today, when I saw it setting this morning quite early, um, it's, it's not even a full moon at all. It was, it was quite, you know, egg-shaped. And, and that is exactly how the phases work, is that w the sun is always shining on the moon. It's always a full moon. But how we see it from down here, you know, looking up at it, as it goes around 50 minutes slower, we're just seeing less and less of the lit side. And it only takes a week and we'll, it's a half moon. Another week, it's a new moon. The moon's, or oh, well, the sun is actually caught up to the moon. So it's a new moon phase. And sometimes they line up so perfectly, it gives us a, a solar eclipse. You know, the moon will actually pass in front of the sun. And then the next night, 
oh, we see a little tiny sliver of moon, and so on and so forth. And in another week, another half moon. It just keeps going around and around. Moon phases are quite easily logical and explainable on a flat stationary plane of Earth, as long as you understand how perspective works and when you're looking up at something very high. We're only looking up at the very bottom of the moon at all times. And the only time we ever see it fully illuminated is when the sun and moon are opposite one another. New moon, they're together. Month Sweet. after month after month. The lunar phases make a lot of sense on a flat stationary plane Earth. A $2 super chat from Ozen snuck in at the last second. He asked, where do space no, no. rocks come from? <laughs> What's a space rock? And there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank both Iron Horse and Jonkel, and I am going to now hand it over to them for their closing statements. And where can we find you guys? Passing that ball right over to you, Iron. It was lovely having you on tonight. Oh, well, thank you, Amy. I, I believe uh, Jokel could go first since he started first but um up to you mate sure so then in that case Jocko I'm gonna hand it over to you and let you have your closing statement sure uh you can find me on twitter at Jocko j-o-k-k-u-l-l on youtube it's 1l deep left Jocko um I don't ever do content like this, so I'm getting out of my comfort zone here, but I wish I did. I, unfortunately, you know, technical issues. I was trying to lure the conversation away from the physical facts and logic sort of stuff into epistemology. Why do we believe what we believe uh, for aesthetical reasons, uh, for ultimately religious reasons when we uh, assign scientists as an authority. Um, psychologically, that is little different from in ancient times assigning priests and shamans as authority. Uh, during this debate, we brought up a lot of technical sort of, you know, Coriolis and Cavendish and subsolar and all these vocabulary terms that you may have been Googling during the debate. And the truth is that there is always going to be more and more questions we can ask about the nature of reality. And as we expose that ignorance, we realize how much we rely upon teams of experts to fill in those gaps in our knowledge, uh, whether it's theoretical, technical, academic, or otherwise. Um, there's huge amounts of knowledge that we're never going to be able to uh, encompass, even if we spend our entire lives trying to learn everything we can, there's always going to be gaps of ignorance. And on that, we have to rely and trust in other people. When that social trust breaks down, I think you get things like the flat earth phenomena, which is an interesting cultural homunculus structure. Spangler would call it a pseudomorphosis, which is kind of a throwback to this Magian culture of 2000 years ago where the earth is flat and there's a dome of the firmament, the heavens above us. I think it's interesting culturally. I think this live stream is interesting. The fact that, you know, you've got at our peak over 300 people willing to tune in and spend money to ask questions. I think people are attracted energetically to, uh, to iron horse. I think, uh, he's a dissident. He's, a uh, an independent thinker, you know, he, he, embodies a certain character type that uh, people are attracted to right now. People are not attracted to conformism. They're not attracted to going with the flow. They want something that's electric and defiant and oppositional. And I think that says something about our culture and you can learn more about what I think about that on my channel. That's pretty much my closing statement. Hand it off to you, Iron Horse. All right, well, well thank you, Jack. Oh, I I hope um, this is still going. Uh, it seems like Amy's jumped out of the room, so I'm not sure what's going on here. But I'll go can ahead. Can you not hear me? Do it anyway. Um, yeah, it would. Oh. I can hear you. Uh, I don't know. It might, for some reason, something reset Maybe itself. And anyway, it seems 
to be going ahead. I can hear you. And, Ooh, and uh, we can hear you. Um, yeah, it is very interesting because, as Jokel said, he is appealing to authority. As Jokel has said, he is appealing to authority in order to formulate opinions about things which he doesn't know. And that's cool. You know, like we all do that. You know, that's always how we do it as we were children. We appeal to authority. We believe in our adults. We're told Santa Claus is real. We're told the Easter Bunny is real. And eventually we get old enough and realize, oh, they're just pulling their leg. Oh, that's okay. We can forgive them because we enjoyed it at the time. It was all sweet and it's good. And, you know, eventually we get to a point then we have to start looking to the greater depths of reality of who do we really believe? Who do we trust? And I think that a flat earther, as myself, you now I, I do put myself a little bit separate. I'm not saying above or better or anything like that, but I put myself separate from most of the others in that I don't believe in any authority figure unless it's something that I can discern for myself. You know, if I can go out and say, Oh, well, yeah, there's an invisible pulling force and, you know, whatever. And and that is basically, I think, what it boils down to is how much do we trust our authority figures? And I think at the end of the day, I think that more and more people are waking up. You know, I don't like to use that term woke, but, but we are waking up to the fact that we are lied to on a daily basis about virtually everything. You know, there, there's not a single thing that we haven't been lied to about. And so you have to develop some sort of mental construct within yourself to say, what do I believe is real? And so you take in all the information you get from all the authorities, from all the hidden information, from all the things that you can take from every source, and then you have the ability to make up your own mind. But if you don't have that information, then you are lacking in the ability to make up your own mind. You are basically just going along to get along until you know better. And then you'll say, hmm, well, you know, I, I, I do question that because it doesn't make sense. How can we have an atmosphere in outer space, in a vacuum of space? How can that atmosphere be moving with us, not just at 1,000 miles per hour, but at 66,000 miles an hour, not just at 66,000 miles an hour, but at the same speed as the sun going 514 million, 514,000 miles per hour, half a million miles per hour every day. All of these speeds have to be put together into something where you have to say, hmm, something is wrong. Something is wrong, and I'm not prepared to accept something that I can't accept as logical, observable, and provable. I just want to know the truth. And so that's where I come into it as a truther. I just want to know the truth. The truth is usually quite simple, as according to Ockham's razor. The least convoluted argument with the least assumptions is most often the most correct one. And so when it comes to gravity, the weight of matter, I believe matter itself is its own weight, and that is gravity. And it only has one universal up and down direction. So, yes, gravity is not a hoax because weight is real. We can observe it and we can measure it. But when you decide that you can measure it on the side of things or the upside downness of things or underwater or in a vacuum, that's where you have lost your mind. You have lost control of your own mind. And only the truth can set you free. Woohoo! All right, guys, I want to thank you both for joining us here on Modern Day Debate. We are a neutral platform welcoming everybody from all walks of life. If you're looking for more fantastic debates in the future, don't forget to like and subscribe, including tonight's debate on Is Gravity Fake? I want to thank our two interlocutors, Iron Horse and Jockle, for joining us tonight. And if you liked anything that either of our guests said, 
Both of their links are in the description below, along with our Discord, which is where many of us will be heading after the show. With that, I am Amy Newman with Modern Day Debate. We hope you continue having great conversations, discussions, and debates. Good night, all. Thanks, Amy. Cheers. Nice. Thanks, Jackal. Thank you, Iron Horse. I assume it's no longer streaming now. I think the music should be playing on the uh, live stream. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Amy's such a pro. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, all fun again.